whichever side you go Oh, I thought. Glacia, I thought you were near I was trying to No temple. No So, I'm going to uh, wrap this stuff off real quick just to get everybody ready for the next session. Uh, I got a couple of masks from Cressy and uh, a quick one for the next two weeks. So if you have uh, 649186, 649186. Oh, wow. I'm going to give you time to get out of the You got that? I got 649. That's awesome. What was your number? 649186. All right, move on. Six four nine one seven six. One seven six. One nine seven. Two zero six. Last three. Two zero six. Keep going. Ah, sweet. I will live to be. Congratulations, Congratulations. Two five zero. Last one. Last three. Two five zero. We'll do another round. I guess, or you want the cookbook? You want the cookbook or the mask? Oh, God. Oh, God. So, what? I'll tell you. So, the mask clicks first.
So if you want to chime in on any of that, I'm going to let people know that you're here. I would love to. Um, things we've done on Twitter, chats, and you know, yes. Facebook, and all those things. Okay. Uh, whether or not you want to come up there and chime in on it. Or I'll be glad to, whatever you want. I'm not shy. Okay. I know you. I'm not either. I just tell them. Yeah, just tell me what you want to focus on, and I'll be glad to do it. Well, this, this is the only slide I have. So the things that a man is okay. Okay. You know what I mean? Right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Anything, if you just want, if you want to, you want, just let me, just let me, uh, look at the notes. <laughs> I'm As we're talking. Okay, perfect. That way I can look at it. I'm Excellent. just going to let them know that you're here. You okay. Stand up to okay. Whatever time. I would love to. I'll come up there. This isn't a long presentation. It's very short. Okay. So if you want to spend two or three or five, whatever. Okay. Talking about social media, what we can do, what we have done. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Watch out for the table. When you wiggle the table, you're wiggling my body. Right, I'll try not to do that. Thank you. There's a lot of good switch about. Right. Thanks. Thank you. 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 you. too. Hello? That's right, you have to wait after you push the buttons on these things. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, our, our next uh, session. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, management and stakeholder contributions, and we have several presenters today uh, for this. Uh, I'd like to bring everybody's attention to uh, the front for just a second um, and uh, to the desired future condition. Remember, this was presented yesterday at the end of our, our afternoon session. Um, these are the uh, draft desired future condition elements that, that we presented yesterday. And even though they're A through F, these aren't prioritized, okay? Just so you all know, these are, are just statements, basically, of this desired future condition. Now, we're going to be using this at uh, 3 o'clock, from 3 to 3.30 in particular, because, well, that's the first time we're going to actually start trying to get some information from you all and some contributions on specifically this DCF. So 
I don't mean to have you looking at this while the presenters are here, but I just want to let you know where it is. It's available for review, and we will start the start the ball rolling, um, you know, right after the break at three, uh, to collect your your input on on this uh, PCF. Now we're not going to be doing when we get to that point. We're not going to be doing any kind of wordsmithing on this. We're going to capture your comments and then kind of come back together as a lionfish working group team at FWC. Take those comments and see how we how we want to massage this. Okay. Um, and that'll all be part of uh, the report out from this back to uh, the participants here, along with the prioritized uh, uh, research um, and management uh, actions that you all contribute here at this meeting. So uh, with that said, let's just go through the research list real quick that you all produced. We uh, took the liberty, if you all will, of, of uh, going through and trying to contract these a little bit because we're going to have to we're going to have to write them on, on fairly large sheets of paper tomorrow so that we can do our, our, our voting. We have to have, we're going to do them in duplicate so it makes it really easy for you guys to get up and put your, your little sticky lionfish stickers on each one that uh, you think is a priority. Um, but uh, let's go through them real quick, make sure we've got, them, we've got them all down. We generalized a little bit, we combined in a couple of places where there, was, um, where there were alignments. Um, but let's, and we didn't, we didn't include the, the headers for each one of these, so this is, this is what you're going to see tomorrow. First one was how can NGOs and citizen scientists um, contribute to lionfish data collection? Next was when and where are lionfish aggregating to reproduce? And this was an issue of uh, maybe we're using acoustic arrays to find out where, um, where these aggregations are. What are the spawning triggers and what's the spawning behavioral, uh, what spawning behavioral research is uh, needed? Uh, what, if anything, is consuming eggs and larvae? And are there larval egg sinks that can be exploited for control efforts? Okay. Um, we, uh, there was a big focus, and, and this was repeated a number of times, on the research on lionfish and estuaries as a major need and priority for Florida. And I know John mentioned uh, quite a number of estuaries. We do have some, some, some fairly big ones here, including Pine Island Sound and all the ones he mentioned. Um, so uh, that's, that's of critical importance. And within that is embedded you know, salinity tolerances, um, you know, the physical characteristics, all the behavioral components of, of estuarine life for these animals. How can social media and websites be better used to share information? Uh, an example is removal efforts uh, among interested parties. Um, and how can social media be used to assist in sharing biological materials among researchers from recreational divers? We may be able to contract that into one social media question, but um, I think they're important enough as, as is. How can we better use social media to publicize public workshops, training, removal needs, gear recommendations, etc.? So social media is a big part of this, you know, um, and I'm not sure those three probably all could be combined in some way. Can we create a threat index for native fishes? What are the effects to native fish from eating lionfish? Are lionfish having an impact on endangered and listed species? An example was direct and indirect interactions with sea turtles. Now, I hope you don't mind. We took the liberty of expanding it to include, you know, all of those listed species. Um, and then, are sea turtles impacting lionfish populations? Kind of back at you. Um, can we feed lionfish eggs and juveniles to native fishes in hatcheries and then release those into the wild to see if they can teach other fish that behavior? Also, examine bioacoustic, pheromone, bioluminescent applications toward lionfish detection and attraction. Identify lionfish specific bait for effective hook and line removal. How do natural lionfish population controls in the Pacific apply to the Atlantic? Are lionfish migrating to deeper depths as a result of removal efforts on shallower reefs? Are there chemical or other controls to prevent lionfish from Future reproducing. Uh, genetic engineering was um, was identified as one of the items within that. Can artificial reefs be designed that are less likely to attract lionfish but still serve other desired functions? There were two questions related to that. We combined them into one, which basically catches the, the essence of both. Um, investigate large scale artificial reef controls to examine lionfish impacts to animal communities and habitats. That gets back to Will's need or Will's suggested need. Examine the, oh, sorry, are lionfish still being introduced to estuarine or marine waters through ballast water? 
the question. And I don't know if still is right. We don't know that they were originally, but you know, uh, are they is probably the best way to address that. Examine the potential for mass destruction mechanisms. I, I like the term, so we've just kind of left it and put it in put it in parentheses. These are your words, so we want to capture those. And I think that's a, an interesting way to, to determine. And uh, biological controls, uh, poison introduction of sterile predators, those kinds of things can be investigated. Um, continue research on development and application of lionfish specific traps. Someone, at some point we were talking about robots. Was that Vlad, was that you? At one point there was some, I would, I would love to know what that thing was in that one picture that somebody had up there. It was a bucket and a little arm coming down. And that <laughs> lionfish robot looked pretty cool. I like that idea. <laughs> um, Evaluate the effectiveness of different removal techniques. Okay. Just a couple more. Can we figure out how many lionfish need to be removed from specific sites to mitigate their impacts? And what is the effort required to maintain control on damaged sites? And an example of that was diver return frequency or maybe application of a lionfish specific trap. How frequently do they need to be put out there? Uh, and I know that. Um, our, our national park folks uh, had a, a pretty good um, uh, you know, assessment of that, but it probably needs to be replicated in other locations. So that's the list of what you all contributed. I'm sure there were many other questions out there, but hopefully we captured most of what your interests are um, and, uh, from a stakeholder perspective. Uh, we will go through a prioritization process with this again tomorrow. Um, but first, what we're going to do is move uh, pretty quickly into our, our management uh, presentation um, component of the, of the summit. And uh, our first talk today is um, from uh, Candy Hanser from the Emerald Coast Reef Association up in Niceville, Florida. Another Panhandle person. Oh, before you get up here, Candy, I forgot. I'm sorry. I need to say, somebody found an iPhone, um, and let's see, where was it? <coughs> Does this look like anybody's? Or, ah. No, I found it. I there we go. It in the bank. Thank you, our, our law enforcement representative. Thank you very much. Somebody turned that in. Yeah. Yeah. You found it and turned it into him. There we go. We'll get this straight one way or the other. Excellent, excellent. Well, we're good to go. It'll be up there. Hop right up there. Hello, everybody. I'm going to have to put this down because I'm a little more sorry than everybody else. Uh, we've heard a lot about what the problems are. What I'm going to talk to you about is a live fish uh, survey that we did, divers. And what we're looking at is creating a lionfish population control program. And in order to do that, we need to understand spearfish men and women so we can create a simple to administer and extremely low cost population control plan that would provide immediate and measurable results. So we have a serious problem. In October of 2010, the first lionfish was spotted off the coast of the Florida Panhandle. On the 13th of October this year, we had a lionfish tournament that brought in 1,737 lionfish. So we know we have a serious problem. We ask, how frequently do you see a lionfish when you dive off the Florida coast? You will notice that every single respondent does see lionfish when they dive off the coast, and most of them see them on every dive. So we were curious about the public concern level, and we wondered if they knew what lionfish was eating, would they be concerned? So we asked them, are you concerned that allowing the lionfish to continue to reproduce at alarming rates without any attempts to control their population will result in lower fish biomass that will affect your access to the fishery and their affordance economy? The overwhelming answer was that they were extremely Concerned, and we know that when we decrease access to the fishery, we do cut harm for this economy. So we asked the people if they would estimate the number of lionfish you have ever seen on a single reef. And you will notice that the most popular answer was between 21 and 50 lionfish. But what was really disturbing to us is that almost 10 percent of the respondents had seen over 100 lionfish on a single reef. So, how can we create an affordable and viable population control program that will provide those measurable results? 
So we decided we could give people the information. It's the same information that has been shared with you today. And we asked the people, taking the information discovered by scientific research into consideration, which method, which method below do you believe um, would save our fishery? When you look at the choices there, you'll notice that their overwhelming choice was for a statewide line fish population control program that would educate the public and provide incentives to divers to incentivize them to target line fish on every dive so that they would be removing um, breeding fish from our fishery. Now, to create a viable plan, we must understand the spear fishers why. Why do they behave the way they do? So we ask them which best describes why you spear. And the number one answer was it's fun, it's challenging, and it's exciting. The number two answer was that uh, they get to get out on the water and bring home groceries. Number three was bonding with family and friends. Number four was again groceries. We cannot do anything about the bonding with family and friends. However, we can create a program it can be fun, challenging, exciting, and it will provide groceries to motivate them. So we also needed to understand the limiting factors that these divers uh, are under. And the number one limiting factor was the sea and weather conditions, which doesn't surprise anybody, I'm sure. Number two might surprise you. The number two limiting factor for divers deciding to go diving is the close seasons for the fish that they're interested in. Number three was the cost of fuel. And number four was the fact that most of them have jobs Monday through Friday that they keep them off the water. So we were also curious about the lionfish spearing frequency. So we asked them, how often do you spear lionfish when you dive in Florida? We were encouraged to see that most spear fishers are spearing lionfish. That was encouraging. However, almost 20% of the divers said never. We also asked them how many lionfish do you usually kill on average each dive? And we noticed that the majority of them said between 1 and 10, and over 20% said never. Now, if you remember on the previous slide, the density that they're seeing is 21 to 50 fish was the most popular answer so we need to change this behavior and if you want to change behavior you first have to understand why people have that behavior to begin with so we ask people if you don't currently spear lionfish what best describes why the top answer for why they don't Spear lionfish is because the open season for the fish they are interested in are short and they need to focus their limited bottom time searching for fish while they're in the season. The next uh, most clicked on answer was that um, there's not enough meat on them to make it worth their while. And the third most popular answer was that they're more trouble than they're worth. Well, of course they are. They'll sting you and there's not very much meat involved so we need to motivate them so we also ask if you don't currently spear lionfish would you begin killing lionfish if you knew that without lionfish population control measures that our fishery is in danger of collapsing overwhelmingly they said yes and what this told us that it is time to educate the public and one of the first things that we need to show them that is that this is what happens when you have no population control measures for 28 years. We went from a little issue to now we're in a crisis situation. Now we need to motivate these divers so because that's going to be critical to the success of any population control program. So how do you motivate spear fishers to aggressively target a fish that can deliver a painful sting, has very little meat, get them to do this year round at their own expense, on their own time and for no pay. So we just ask them of the situations below, which one would you would get you most motivated to dive more frequently and uh, aggressively spear lionfish? The most popular answer was fishing exemptions that would allow them to take fish 
out of season. If you notice, the other options in our fair are costly, and our state does not have the money to do those, but we do give them the options to choose. Now, when you think about um, spearfishers having an exemption where they can go out and get a fish, think about it as a return on investment. Would you trade one day of fish per diver for a year that if you knew that you could save 30 native fish 365 days a year, would that be a good investment? What if you could save 3,000 native fish per year? Now remember, these divers have those limiting factors that we just talked about in the video that includes the weather conditions, the cost of fuel, and those nine to five jobs that uh, pay for their diving. So this is how it would work. Lionfish would be removed by volunteers at their own expense. The State Fish and Wildlife would reward divers with no cost fishing exemptions, and divers would remain motivated to aggressively target the lionfish year round. And here's how it works. Remember, we need to make it fun, exciting, and um, provide groceries and challenging. So we thought 100 lionfish would be challenging for most spearfishers in our state. We don't want to set the number so high that people would look at it and say, I can never accomplish that, so I'm not going to even try. And if they turn in 100 lionfish, they could have one fish of their choice, which takes the pressure off of any specific sp fish species. And they could take one fish, one extra fish if the fish was in season, and one fish per trip if the fish that they chose was out of season. But to renew the exemption, they would have to turn in another 100 lionfish. So if we want to maximize the removal, what we do is we offer them the opportunity to earn, especially in the first two years of the program, offer them the opportunity to earn multiple year exemptions. For example, if they turn in 200 lionfish, they could have a two year, one fish per trip limit, or they could opt to have uh, two fish per trip for one year. That would give the uh, cowboys out there aggressively hitting those lionfish and we could really take a lot of lionfish out of the water very quickly. So what are the possibilities with this program? If we have just one diver that earns an exemption that would kill 100 lionfish, which would remove approximately 100 million lionfish eggs from our water, 10 would remove 1,000 lionfish and remove 1 billion eggs. 100 would remove 10,000 lionfish from the water and 10 billion eggs, a thousand people that qualified would remove 100,000 lionfish and 100 billion eggs approximately. So when you think about that, think about the massive and swift removal and what an impact that would have on our fishery. Because when we're removing those fish, we're also removing the future years of reproduction cycles, and a blind fish can have a lifespan that exceeds 10 years. Approximately half of all the eggs that would be removed would have been females who would have produced 2 million eggs per year, and half of their offspring would have also been egg-producing uh, females. So how will we measure success? Well, the number one measure of success is how many lionfish are we removed from the fishery. Another measure of success is our ability to increase diver participation because this problem is so big and it's going to last for years while we wait for our scientists to come up with a, a good answer. Uh, but we need to have their participation. And the third measure of success is going to be the increased native fish, juvenile fish survival rate. And all three of those are very important. And management priorities. This was one of the last questions that we asked. Is how should government agencies who are charged with protecting our fishery prioritize the importance of controlling the population of the lionfish in our waters? The overwhelming answer was that the lionfish needs to be the number one priority. Now, I wouldn't have said that. Um, few years ago, but as I'm seeing what's happening to our fishery, I think they're right on that. 
If anyone in this room would like to have a copy of the complete Lyme Disease Population Control Program, they can contact me at candy at valkyrie.net. Uh, it does have some research possibilities where uh, people can connect up with the lionfish hunters that are removing the fish so researchers can get free fish for research. Um, and I am going to ask everyone here to please save our fishery and implement statewide lionfish population control because that is the only thing at this point right now that we know will make a difference is make, taking fish out of the water so they're no longer breeding. And does anyone have any questions? No questions? There you go, Vlad. I uh, thought it would be Vlad. Yeah, oh, I thought. Microphones. Okay. Thanks. Kenny, that was really interesting. Stand up. Sorry. That, that was really interesting. I appreciate the time you took to, to put that survey together. It looked like there were 103 respondents to the survey. Yes, there were. And who, who were the respondents? Could you give us a little? Info on the survey went to and who was the, the survey was posted on our website and we did not collect any identifying information. I work with volunteers all the time and I know how people and you guys are scientists, you know how people are funny about they don't want to give you their personal information. So we did not ask for personal information. Uh, we just put it out there and when divers uh, go to the site and take a survey, we do survey monkey uh, to do the survey. And this is after the survey is something if we had more time to promote it properly. I was doing a line that's coming in as you guys saw. So I didn't have a lot of uh, promotion time, but I had plenty of promotion time because we probably would have had more respondents. Anybody else? Yes. If you guys could please stand up when you speak. I agree, that's an interesting concept. I was just wondering if you had um, consulted with any uh, fishery biologists that are doing stock assessments to those scenarios where you said a thousand people participated. Um, how did they weigh in on the effects on the species by removing that many more out of season or? The numbers, the numbers, the way that I came up with the numbers is from the two million fish per female per year. And I have a calculation, so I could use that one for myself. Allowing 1,000 people to qualify to take 1,000 more native species in your fish. I just don't know. Uh, I may not be understanding your. Uh, you're talking about the, the single native fish that is taken from the fishery through the fishing exemption. Um, no, no one has run any calculations on that. However, when you're looking at the diving population that spears lionfish, it's very small compared to the diving population that spear other fish and that uh, don't spear at all. Most divers don't spear. Most divers are what I call looky loos and like to go and look. Um, and if we can encourage those people to join the hunt, that's really important. That's why I thought it was very important to remove the fishing licensing requirement to bring some of those people in. But um, there are not that very many spear fishers out there compared to like fishermen. We have thousands and thousands of spear fishermen, but not so many. I mean, hooking line fishermen, not so many spear fishermen. Yes. Candy, have you given any thought to bringing those line fish to market in, in your areas of state? I am not opposed to bringing fish to the market, and one of the good things about this particular proposal is people would only have to turn in the heads. So if they wanted to take the fillets and market those to the commercial industry, that would be fine. But in turning in the heads, they would be encouraged to kill lionfish of every size, not just the larger ones that might be more commercially um, Bible. Yeah. You had somebody else? It was, I just wanted to ask where you surveyed the camera. Right? Uh, it's on our website. Anyone can take it. It's at uh, www.ecreading.com. Oh, no, I meant, um, I'm sorry, your geographic location. Like the divers were. 
the, the, the majority of the people who took the survey were in the Florida Panhandle, but there were some people who took the survey from different parts of the state. Yes, we did. We opened it up because this is a problem. It's not just affecting the Florida Panhandle, it's affecting all of us, no matter where we are in the state, in the Caribbean, or the Atlantic. This is something we all need to start addressing. Anybody else? Yes. Um, can you please tell me what the likelihood is that you get that kind of exemption in the fishing licenses? The, the fishing license exemption has already passed, and there was an executive order last year, and it was made permanent this year. So you no longer re require a fishing license to hunt for lionfish. I mean, with your credit, with your extra credit. You mean the likelihood of getting that exemption? Your um, your 100 fish and then you get one next time. Um, your fish. Oh, how? Okay, I'm reading them. Are you asking me how likely it is that someone can bring in 100 lionfish? Well, I was understanding that the exemption um, doesn't take into account your credit for if you brought in 100. Uh, mining fish that you get one extra fish, you know, in your uh, not not one extra lion fish, fish of their choice from the fishery. Right. But that's not in the law right now, correct? No, that is not in the law. This is something for our fishery managers to consider. And um, it's really the only thing that I've heard since I've been here, the only thing that's going to start taking massive numbers of lionfish out of our waters very quickly, and that's what I'm really interested in, is getting the breeding population out of the water as quick as we can. And so that proposal that you had, what's the likelihood and how would you go ahead to get that implemented? Well, we have fishery managers that have to make decisions, and they have to decide whether or not that return on investment is worth it. And so that's something that you might want to contact the fishery managers for the state, and other countries might want to talk to their fishery managers and, um, and see if they can't get that passed through so that we can save our fishery. We need to act quickly. We can't sit three or four more years looking at the problem and documenting it. We need to act quickly. Because if we don't, we are going to see a huge decline in our fish fire mass, and that is going to affect our um, <coughs> open seasons. And especially a state like Florida that is a coastal state, that is going to have a huge impact on Florida's economy. Anybody else? Yes. Well, this is not a question, it's more like a comment. I think it's a brilliant idea because you're targeting a food that is not very productive. You're going to lavish, although those are the most capable to go and do it. So it, it might sound for a lot of um, scientists in here like a terrible thing to allow one protected fish to be sacrificed. But if you really analyze the trade, and once you have this ball rolling, you're going to have all the target spear fishing community interested in lionfish. I think this is a very viable thing for the government doesn't need to come up out of the pocket with pretty much anything, but just to relax the permission to do that. So I think from all the strategies I've been hearing, this is, this is really a good one to consider. Thank you. Does anybody else have a question? Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time. And I'll ask you. Okay. Um, some, some good conversations, some good discussions on that, and a great contribution from Candy. Thank you very much. Um, we'd also like uh, to um, remind everybody again, Dan, Dan did it, he had asked me to do it before and I forgot, to please stand uh, when you are uh, asking your questions. That way they can be captured, um, like, they can be captured better, I guess, on camera, so you know, your face will be up there and we'll be able to see who you are. Um, the next talk is uh, creating a commercial market for lionfish. 
Uh, and that'll be presented by Bill Kelly, the Executive Director of the Port of Peace Commercial Fishermen's Association, and he's from Marathon, Florida. So, Bill. Well, good afternoon, folks, and uh, a pleasure to be here and address you from uh, Ground Zero uh, in the uh, Lionfish Invasion, if you will. Um, we've been uh, we are very actively involved in, in our principal occupations are the harvest of spiny lobster, stone crab, and pinfish in that water. And we're very much concerned about the impact that this invasion may have on the species that we have to we, uh, harvest. Uh, we've been very heavily involved in cooperative research with reef.org uh, and QR and assisting them in gathering information. Also working with uh, graduate, postgraduate students from the University of Florida and the uh, University of Miami. And I think we're, we're developing some very important databases here, but we certainly have a lot of work to do. In the Florida Keys, geographic, geographic distribution is rather widespread, as we all know, uh, but uh, very heavily documented on both sides of the island, from dry port tubers uh, to Key Largo, both inshore and off. Uh, highest yield occurs with traps placed oceanside in 140 to 200 feet of water. Um, well documented and abundant after abundant to 300 feet while still targeting spiny lobster. And uh, it starts to get very interesting here because um, at any given time, we've got, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, 450,000 spiny lobster traps out there. We may have 600,000 uh, uh, stone crab traps scattered throughout the Keys and on both sides of the peninsula. Yet uh, uh, there's virtually no harvest by stone crab here. Obviously, uh, they must be. Uh, I'm very much afraid of stone crab. At least that's what we're surmising. Uh, and then the other thing is that less than one percent of the harvest that takes place in traps occurs shallower than one hundred feet. Uh, and you know, when you think about it, out of those million traps that we've got out there on both sides of Florida, all the way down to the Tortugas, probably ninety percent of them are less than uh, in water, less than one hundred feet deep. Um, in the Gulf of Mexico, we see. Uh, very little uh, in, in our area down, say, from the, the uh, Everglades area and, and surrounding area. But there's very little structure on the Gulf side to hold these fish, and we know that they do like that. And we'll get into that a little bit. But, uh, for example, we had one of our uh, gentlemen, Carl Massard, that pulled 2,500 uh, spiny lobster traps last week. We had three lion fishing. But the interesting thing was that all of them were pushing two pounds. Very big fish. Uh, very rarely do you see the small guys deep in what we call the back country or back in the Gulf of Mexico. We get closer to shore here now, in around the, the islands on the Gulf side, and then from the Atlantic side along the islands, all the way out to the, the reef system at 85 feet of water, there's a substantial number of lion fish, but very little interaction with our traps. And we're surmising here again that probably, even though there's extensive populations there, they prefer to interact with that natural habitat rather than going into the traps. Now, once we get off the reef line there, then brother, it's a whole different story. Uh, because we we finding that we have a second, well, we know that we have a second reef 180 to 200 feet of water. It's very substantial. But starting at 140 feet of water, the harvest really gets heavy. And, and, and all the way up to 200, in my view, we're still directing our efforts at spiny lobster, not lionfish. And we've had it documented out as deep uh, as 300 feet of water, again, using a standard lobster track, and that being the main direction of our harvest. I'd like to turn your attention to uh, Captain Gary Nichols. Gary has been so helpful to all of us in supplying information, providing uh, uh, opportunities for folks from uh, uh, these different universities that we've done working right along. But uh, he fishes primarily in the middle of Topper Keys. His boat and email address is lightforce171 at AOL.com. You can feel free to contact Gary if you'd like. Very appropriately dubbed the Lion King. Now, check out, take a look at this catch history here. We uh, first started getting involved in this in 2009 when they were good to eat. Came up with 49 pounds of uh, lion fish and said, well, you know, so what? He enjoyed a couple of dinners and stuff like that and liked what he tasted. And then things started to get hot and heavy. Um, in 2010, you could see a thousand pounds escalating rapidly. Uh, the fish, both in volume and size, here up to 10,000 pounds last year. 
On track this year, Gary said to maybe harvest 18,000 pounds. And again, this is with a directed effort at spying an option. Um, what he has found out, though, is that by adjusting the location of his traps, when lobster is slow, whether due to the, uh, weather conditions or it's because of the phase of the moon or something, Gary can make some subtle shifts in his gear and so forth and then turn them into big lion fish producers. And he's getting a pretty good buck for it too, about six and a quarter pound right now, unguided, that's substantial. Largest fish today, three pounds and 18 inches, and the deeper you go, the bigger the fish. Productivity and seasonal fluctuations. The cooler months of the year, late fall into early spring, uh, are especially productive. We see a noticeable increase in yield as soon as water temperatures begin to cool. Typically in that area of 88 degrees, and uh, anyone that's from the Keys knows that you can find 88 degrees and 140 feet of water quite easily during the summer months. But you start to cool down here a little bit, and we're getting into 78 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and things really start to happen. Gary's experience, again, uh, as many as 25 per trap. 20 trap Paul, uh, trawl will typically produce 50 pounds of live fish. And he's, he averages uh, you know, 500 pounds per week, but has harvested as much as 500 pounds in one day on a 400 trap pool. That's amazing. Gary says that if, if I had a lion specific trap, live fish specific trap, and I targeted them solely, he said I could produce uh, a conservatively estimated 500 pounds per day per thousand traps. So uh, uh, in, in a week's time, that very very conveniently uh, harvest or work a thousand or five thousand traps in a week's time. So we're looking at some pretty substantial numbers starting to develop. Broken bottom, meaning post summer relief for structure, is the most productive. Uh, we in 140, 150 feet, though we're midway between that inshore reef. And that second one out in 180 to 200 feet, uh, what we would more commonly find out there would be ledges and, and that kind of structures and what we would call broken bottom. Uh, interesting though, and it, it's uh, listening to some of the presentations, this occurs primarily during the main spawning season for lionfish. So I'm wondering if there's any spawning aggregations maybe forming in that area and they're, they're seeking any kind of structure just to develop their own little bite them, uh, if you will because they're so crowded on the natural reef habitat. Uh, crew training and handling. This is something that's come up here and, and uh, talked about safety of handling these fish. Uh, Gary and the boys have been at it for five years. It's, uh, in the training phase, they all go over the basics, but it's been a learning experience for all of them together. They use 12 to 18 inch tongs to remove fish from the trap. They don't use the puncture proof gloves. Uh, over the course of the past five years, they had have had to call fire rescue five or six times in, in the uh, in that five year period because someone's had a uh, you know a significant reaction to this, if you will. Uh, but uh, a lot of it is is hype, it's anxiety associated. Uh, their treatment that they found over five years now is that immediately upon that impact or that sting, uh, take two Benadryls that help reduce swelling and discomfort, and then one will be uh, leave to uh, take care of pain. Half hour later, administer another two bad drills. And then uh, compromise presses, as was mentioned earlier in the day, are very effective. It's hot as you can stand it, certainly not scalding, where you would cause additional uh, injury to yourself. Uh, the pain usually subsides in about 45 minutes. And something very interesting that Gary brought up is, is that his crewmen, who he's had a number of them for a long time, they're actually building up a tolerance to, to their venom. Gary has been stung so many times you can't keep track of them with their number anymore. But now if he gets spiked by one of these things, usually it takes nothing, usually about 15 minutes or so, uh, the, the pain and the irritation has subsided. So that's, that's pretty interesting as well. Uh, and again, unless, uh, unless you're really highly susceptible to anaphylactic shock or something like that, uh, usually, that Benadryl will leave uh, treatments will take care of this as well. Uh, viability of a lion fish trap program. Trapping is, uh, from what we've seen in our experience, is the proven method for high yield harvesting. Uh, and again, this is with a limited directed effort on our part because the you know, focus is spiny lobster and stone crab. Uh, reducing bycatch through a trap design is a top priority in any successful trap program. We know that in the state of Florida, we've dealt with issues, you know, especially with fish traps. And so we've got to come up with something that will work 
uh, and provide a high yield uh, for us if we're going to market these and be successful at it. Uh, but again, bycatch is always the issue in any fishery here. And uh, we saw some interesting designs a little bit earlier this morning. I'm interested in being together with uh, uh, with Vanessa and taking a second look at those things. Um, funding for well planned effort uh, has been lacking, and that's, uh, that's been the case since I talked to Dr. James Morris many, many years ago when he first sounded the alarm over a dollar a decade ago about lion fish and said, We need to get on this right away, or we're going to have problems. We have problems. Um, evaluation by an accredited institution is it's so very much essential. Florida Fish and Wildlife Research Institute noted or no. Uh, you know, known around the world for the quality of the work that they do. We get a program out there and we certify this that it's, it's minimal and bycatch. Uh, that's essential, I think, to a, a, a workable program, the quality of the data and everything that they would provide, and the thoroughness of the review, and then, of course, creating consumer demand is an absolute must. Uh, and what I've done is uh, taken the opportunity to invite a very good friend of mine, Steve Johnson from Johnson Communications. He has one of the largest databases of uh, marine writers and, and marine interest uh, marine manufacturers around the world. And Pete uh, is especially uh, public relations and marketing. And Pete, if we could come on up with us, because that's it. The segue right here is creating consumer demand, which is an absolute must. And Pete will share some very interesting points with us, okay? Thanks, Bill. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. And folks, thank you very much. As Bill mentioned, I work with a number of communicators around the world and uh, fishing editors, uh, outdoor editors like Susan Cockney from the Miami Herald who's here. And uh, I think Bill Sargent uh, from the Florida Today newspaper is going to try. I know the news, uh, one of the news editors from the Florida Today newspaper is here. Uh, Jim uh, Warsley, I believe it is. Anyway. Those are the people I communicated with. They're the traditional media that uh, we get the uh, get the word out to, uh, along with uh, radio and, and uh, uh, television stations around the uh, around the country, networks. And to start off with the marketing, uh, a little bit of the marketing in regards to what uh, Bill was just talking about. Um, Gary, five years ago, uh, has helped to. Be a star is born. Gary uh, Nichols and uh, making the lionfish a star as well from an eating, uh, from a harvesting and eating standpoint, even though uh, it was a bycatch. And Gary would, and his father would fill a cooler with ice and the lionfish, and he'd drive up to the area restaurants there in the Florida Keys and start showing the chefs uh, cooking techniques and how, how tasty they were. And many of them came up with their own recipes, and he uh, eventually got uh, more started along the way with uh, more restaurants uh, in the area uh, having them on their meals when they could get them on their menu. And uh, so there was a demand started in the uh, Florida Keys for them. The Coconut Express, uh, the term uh, in the Florida Keys is the word of mouth getting up around uh, uh, throughout the Keys. And the word traveled fast, and uh, as it took off in the Florida Keys, once the diners experienced them, once they uh, uh, got to eat them and order them, um, it, uh, they, they got excited about this, uh, this new food source. Um, and Gary, in turn, uh, is marked being in the uh, Florida Keys, uh, as well as up in Miami, New York City. They uh, send the flash freeze these uh, fish in 50 pound, 50 pound uh, blocks and send them up to um, the uh, restaurants up in uh, the New York City area, also the uh, coastal uh, South Carolina in Charleston. So again, grassroots marketing at this point. And um, uh, he's also donated hundreds of uh, pounds of, uh, of the lionfish to uh, organizations like Lad has with, uh, with Reef. Now the difficulty is meeting the demand while uh, the need to establish a, a commercial market. And some of the marketing techniques, uh, obviously appealing to the recreational uh, sport diver, um, as and we're going to be we're talking about the uh, commercial side, but it's also creating consumer awareness, getting the word out to uh, out to the public that uh, hey, this is a, a viable industry and a great tasting fish. So creating demand 
uh, out among the uh, public through <laughs> newspapers, uh, magazines, TV, radio, uh, cooking shows, just a number of entities and, and spreading the word. Um, again, networking through uh, the national and international media, letting um, uh, other world uh, organizations, uh, news organizations know about this, and uh, again, building the demand. Um, several of the uh, presenters have talked about social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and that's also important. Uh, generating marketing through uh, major distributors, um, plus uh, again, you have uh, no size limits, no back limits, no seasonal closures, uh, getting the distribution out there and uh, turn it over to free enterprise, the, uh, the private uh, entities to uh, to help market this as well and uh, to sell the ideas. And uh, gentlemen like uh, Gary Nichols and, and his family in, in regards to uh, getting it uh, uh, and, and, and moving it forward. Product identification and branding, again, it's an exceptional table fare. Uh, it's, it's a perfect hybrid between uh, the uh, grouper and, uh, and the uh, hogfish. Uh, it uh, it's, has a tougher outer skin like a grouper, and then the uh, delicate meat and taste of a hogfish. And, and again, everybody that uh, experiences it, and I think you're gonna have, you'll have uh, an experience uh, this afternoon with, uh, at, at the social hour um, to, uh, to acquaint yourself with the taste if you have it. They freeze well, they extended uh, shelf life, uh, and they taste like uh, fresh pot when thawed and prepared two or three months later. Uh, nutritionally healthy, they're high in omega-3s. They're also visibly appealing, and uh, again, uh, for its taste. Uh, they're beneficial to the uh, environment in regards to harvesting and eating them. Uh, eating the lionfish, you're seven, saving 70 species of fish out there. Uh, the reef fish, including snapper and grouper fry. So that's very important. Uh, harvested uh, to hazard analysis and critical control standards. This country, the uh, U.S., has uh, some of the strictest laws in regards to handling seafood. And uh, it produces one of the highest regulated standards uh, for seafood for safety, for freshness, and responsible harvesting. So that's, that's also highly important in the uh, uh, product identity and branding uh, of, uh, of the uh, lionfish. And where are we today? Well, only, there's only uh, three Gary Nichols uh, down in the Florida Keys at this point. And again, it's all bycatch at this point, not, uh, not targeted species. So hopefully uh, we need to uh, generate high yield to, uh, to make this go need to uh, challenge to uh, meet the demand, of, uh, create a supply and a demand, and effective harvesting methods are needed, um, trapping with species-specific traps. Coming up with traps, uh, I think uh, Bill and his crew have about three or four that they're looking at, but we need the uh, research and, and uh, funding to make this, uh, make this uh, a viable trade and uh, get it uh, into more restaurants, into more seafood markets. Um, this, first, or this fish can be a real commercial entity. And uh, again, a specialty uh, culinary dish. Again, the big issue is bycatch. Um, we need to have cooperative uh, efforts to, uh, among all the parties, effective uh, well-funded marketing efforts and uh, again cooperative efforts we need to make an immediate call for funding uh, research and design for uh, trap designs financing for the trap designs and again make it species specific um, working together with state uh, fishing commissions uh, not only Florida but uh, Alabama Mississippi as uh, these uh, as these fish extend even heavier uh, with density into uh, areas like Texas and then on up to uh, North Carolina, uh, as we're already seeing, uh, getting the cooperation of these uh, fish commissions as well as the departments of agriculture and commerce uh, with NOAA from the federal side, and again, uh, alerting the media and working with them on a worldwide basis. And again, private enterprise can uh, certainly help and get the attention of more job creation, more tourism, like uh, like the uh, uh, spear fishing, the dive community, brings more people down to, to hunt for these fish and eat the enemy. 
Um, in another life, I worked with uh, red ported fire ants, and when I saw the, uh, uh, in, in some 85 years, uh, I've watched the migration of them coming back, uh, starting back in 1928, 1930, uh, from Mobile, the Biloxi area, and expanding over through about 16 to 18 states now. That's been in 85 years, and that's 16 to 18 states. Well, compare that to the 28 years now that the lionfish have, um, have been underway, the migration, and the, the maps that Ladd at Reef showed and that uh, Candy at uh, Emerald Coast showed. Ladies and gentlemen, this isn't a battle, it's a war. And now is the time to get started with different tools. Uh, you have the, uh, uh, the infantry with the uh, spear fishermen, but you need a bigger tool and uh, dispatch the battleships with the uh, commercial side to really make this a go. Thank you. We have time for a question, if anybody has one out there for me or okay. Yes, sir. Um, please stand up and we'll get your mic. My name is Bob Spake. I'm with the Southern Offshore <coughs> Fishing Association, which is uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. We catch grouper, snapper, bob fish uh, for many years. Uh, if you talk about in the deep of water, we have larger fish. And the only way that I can see that you can get to the 20 fathom break and 30 fathoms is by traps. And along with saying that, I uh, tried to bring traps back a few years ago, and Luis Barbieros had a big seminar at FWC. And what you're going to find out, you all don't get together, if you think traps are the way to go for the deeper harvest, you're going to have to push hard because it's a political football. Uh, there was a big problem many years ago. It was uncontrolled. Nobody will deny that. But today, we have so many more tools in the toolbox to control that we have. Visual monitoring systems in the Gulf, so you have to know where the boat is at all times. They have to check in, they have to check out. You can make them bring the traps home, and on and on and on. So if you do that, I think you have to unite together and come up with a good trap and a good program, and we'll be able to help you with the deeper water eradicate these fish. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Pete, Bill, thank you very much. Uh, good, a good presentation on the commercial side, the development of the incentivized market. Um, we now have uh, one, uh, our last uh, management talk of the day. Alan Pierce um, with FWC out of Tallahassee in the Division of Marine Fisheries is going to provide uh, an overview of wine fish management in Florida today. How you doing? Alan Pierce. I'm in the Division of Marine Fisheries Management in Tallahassee. I work with Dan, and I hope all of you uh, thank Dan. He's put a lot into this conference. He's, we're not conference planners, so it's been kind of a challenge. Um, and one of the things I want to start off with is a little bit of an explanation in terms of the structure of the agency. We have a lot of different divisions. Uh, we have a commission that is uh, that are put in place by the governor, they're appointed, they make the ultimate decisions, but we also have a number of divisions that are involved in a lot of highly variable divisions that are involved in different things. Lionfish happens to cut across a lot of different divisions in the state, uh, within the agency. Um, we have FWRI, you've heard a lot about the research that they're doing, and certainly they have a, a huge role in lionfish research. We have HSC, Habitat and Species Conservation, that handles a lot of the invasive species problems in the state. They haven't done a lot with marine fish because, like you've heard, this is the first big marine fish that's been a problem from an invasion standpoint. We have the Division of Marine Fisheries Management where we're located. We're headquartered in Tallahassee. And we have different subsections like artificial reef that are involved with lionfish. We have rule making that's obviously involved with lionfish. Um, we have outreach and education. 
Uh, in addition to the division, we also have a community relations division that handles a lot of our communications with the public and the media. So I guess the point of all this is that Lionfish is, has been a challenge for the agency because there's no one place that it falls. It's sort of a square peg and we've got six or seven round holes. And so we have a multitude of, of different people around the state in different divisions with different jobs that are all related in controlling, in involved in controlling lionfish. So simple thing like planning this conference has been quite a challenge for us internally because we had to involve everyone. Dan Eleanor has done a, uh, a huge job. He's not a conference planner, but he's done a great job. And hopefully, all of y'all will thank Dan for his efforts. He, he almost jumped out of his uh, a window a few times. <laughs> and uh, in a long, yeah, there you go. And, and so, along those lines, there's really no one person in the agency that, that really has all the pieces. And I can, I'm going to flip through some slides, I can tell you a lot more about certain aspects than others because some of them fall outside of our division. Um, but I can tell you one thing, if you miss one of those conference calls when you're planning a conference, you're going to end up speaking. And so, that's <laughs> and one other thing, um, it doesn't show up on your agenda, but Alicia Wellman is here in the front and she has volunteered. She didn't even have to beg her, but one of the slides is on um, um, social media. Social media. And <laughs> see, I know that much about social media. And you know, Alicia yeah. said, I said, Alicia, can you just tell me a couple things to say? And she said, no, I'll just do it for you. And I said, <laughs> All right, so this is just a little outline about some of the things. And, and really, our role as we see it, there's there's certain things we can do to help with lion fish and other things that we can't. We can't all we're not all divers. FWC staff can't don suits and spears and jump in the water and go get all the lion fish. But what we can do is we can do a lot of work in the realm of outreach and education. And we're doing a lot of things. I mean our we've really ramped up in the last two, three years and we've got a number of shows and events. We can also make regulatory revisions and, and I don't want to beat on that too much because you've already heard it in three or four other places already, but we'll, we'll run through that. And then we can also play an influential role in interagency coordination and communication. And we're gearing up on that front as well. So in terms of presentation, shows, and events, we, we do angler intercepts to educate um, recreational fishermen. We're always providing information to the public about lion fish when we do those things. We have the ladies let's go fishing shows and kids fishing clinic events around the state each year. We have some food festivals that we participate in, Florida Sportsman Expo, the FWRI Marine Quest event each year. And, um, and then we make presentations upon request to fishing clubs and diving clubs around the state. And so if any of you know anyone out there that would like to have FWC come in and do a short presentation about lionfish or any other marine fisheries management topics, you know, all they have to do is call and we get out there and do that. Um, the recreational saltwater regulations book, that happens to fall right to me. I help put that together every six months and we print about close to 600,000 of these things. And it's also up on our website as well and it's probably a million, I don't know how many hits a year. It's one of the most used pages I think that we have. Um, in terms of the web page, but this booklet, um, we featured uh, lionfish on the cover of the book in January of this year. We've also, those three articles that I took a picture of and put up here are feature articles that we've placed in the last three issues of this book. Um, like I said, it comes out every six months. And we're going to continue to make sure lionfish has a presence in that booklet because this is one of the most, um, one of the ways that we communicate with the fishing community. Everybody that recreational fishes needs a copy of this book, whether they use the online version or whether they get a hard copy. This is a, a primary means of communication for us. We also have a lionfish webpage, and this webpage includes photographs, basic life history information, information about the invasion. Um, it's got some video clips. I believe it has a frequently asked questions section where the public can go and look through questions and get a lot of answers. 
So this is another important page, and we actually have links to this page from many other places on the website. We have developed a QR code that we put on our publication so people can take their smartphone and swipe this QR code. I used to think they looked like Sudoku puzzles. I didn't know what a QR code was until Amanda taught me. But anyway, these, um, this page is sort of the primary place that people can go and, and get information. There's also information on here about how you can report your lionfish sightings or catches. Uh, social media. Well, I tell you what, Lisa, don't, don't jump up yet. Why don't we come back to this? Okay. Because then you don't have to jump up and then I jump down and back up and all that. But anyway, at least you're going to stand up in a few minutes and kind of walk through some of the things we've done on Twitter and YouTube and Twitter, all these other things. <laughs> yeah, I haven't done my first tweet yet, but I did make a Facebook <laughs> post, just one. So anyway, at least you going to jump up at the end of this and, and she's, a, she's an expert. Um, this is Dan's baby right here. This lionfish teacher took Dan six months. <laughs> and he loved every minute of it. But we got a lionfish design done internally. We produced uh, 500 or 1,000 of these t-shirts. We, we, we got them out to dive clubs. We got them out to artificial reef associations, anyone that was doing a lionfish derby. We used them as um, prizes for some online contests, people sending in photos. That's part of what Alicia's going to talk about. But this was our first effort at a lionfish control team uh, t shirt. I think we've got a new design. We're probably going to be pr producing more of these t shirts. But it's a great way to get the public in tune with the lionfish invasion and what, what a real problem it is. And you can see the little QR code that's on the t shirt. You can actually scan somebody's t shirt and it takes you right to our lionfish webpage where you, know, you can get a lot of information. Um, we produced a lionfish brochure. I believe we printed 12,500 of these. We've done two prints of it. Again, it has a lot of the same life history information, information about the invasion, what to do if you're stung, how to safely handle lionfish. But that's another item. We, we sent this around to FWC staff in all parts of the state. We asked staff to go out and put these in dive shops so the public can come in to People are getting their tanks filled. They're going to see this in a dive shop. Be able to pick this up. It's all all along the same lines of getting information out to the public about how they can help control lionfish as the first line of defense. This is a brand new um, tank sticker. It's a, this this goes on dive tanks. We use it other ways, uh, but it's designed to go on uh, dive tanks. This this is a very beautiful design. I really like that. And our internal folks. We have some graphics folks that, that do art, and a, a nice lady helped us with that, so we didn't go outside for it. We've got, we produced maybe 10,000 of these, and we have these available. There are some here at the show. We're also going to be doing kind of like a brochure. We're going to have staff in all parts of the state take these out, put them in dive shops. We're hoping to encourage um, the public to pick these up. There are no cost to anyone, and, and put these on their tanks, and it's just uh, another means of getting the word out about lionfish. Derby participation and support. I, I'd say we were a little we were a little late in the game on this, but we have participated in a derby or two. We haven't hosted a derby ourselves, but we are participating. We're willing, ready, and able to help facilitate lionfish derbies. We we bounced around ideas of trying to figure out a way to help fund lionfish derbies. Uh, we did a contract agreed to provide some financial support for the three most recent ones that they held. Um, but we can always come and participate in lionfish derbies. Amanda and Ali and I went to the one in North uh, East Florida that was held a couple months ago. And uh, we actually cleaned lionfish, you know, talked to the participants, talked to the public that was standing around asking questions about what was going on. But um, we, we really have an interest in, in finding new ways that we can participate. You know, we don't have directly funding for lionfish, so it's not like we have a big pot of money that has been laid out and we can just pass out money for every lionfish derby. I wish, I wish we did. Um, but what we can do to facilitate and encourage lionfish control through the derbies, we want to do that. We can certainly help you advertise if somebody's hosted one. We can get information up on our website um, and we can actually show up at the event too. Um, HSC has these non-native fish roundups, and I know absolutely 
zero about these, but they've been designed in the past um, primarily for freshwater fish. They're a way to get the public to understand that you know we've got various cichlids, snakeheads swimming around in our canals and freshwater bodies, but there's no reason that this can't be extended to uh, to, to lionfish as well. But it is an example of events that we do that kind of help control. Um, you know, freshwater invasive species. It's kind of, you know, controlling things, we, we're, used to, we're, we're all about conserving things. And when you start talking about programs to get rid of things, it's a little, it's a little off for FWC as a whole. So, but that's an example of what we've done on the freshwater side. We also host these pet amnesty days where you can take your invasive, noxious critter from your tank and you can bring them in and give them away. And um, there's no reason why people can't bring lionfish to these events as well. And it's a way, it's, it's an educational tool as well. You know, we've got things in tanks that, that pose a risk to the environment. Um, we have not shut the door on the airplanes landing at Miami Airport and, and, uh, and Orlando International Airport full of lionfish that are going into tanks. But th there is a mechanism here to, take, to get people to take them out of the tanks and go, and dispose of them via donating them to one of these pet amnesty days. Um, we are also in the very early stages of developing a lionfish app, and I believe we've um, contracted with an outside entity that is helping us develop an app. And so when I heard, I think it was Lab talking about reef developing an app today, and I'm standing in the back of the room, and I'll leave every app then. Is that the same app that we're doing? Oh, that's good. So, Anyway, I guess the point here is we, we, we're, we were all, we're, we're always, a, I guess, a day late, but, um, and I don't know if we need to be working together on this. Thing. That's something we need to talk about, but we're developing an app that will be an, FS, uh, an FWC app that is going to allow people to, while they're out on the boat, on a dock, take a picture, instantly upload it to our site with information about number, size, depth, location, all that information. I think it will be a good tool whether we work with Reef or we have two different apps. We don't want to recreate any wheels, but once again, we weren't necessarily aware that other people were doing things. And that's part of what this conference is about, is for us to find out what is everybody else doing. And so um, we'll probably be talking about that some more. And I think Amanda, if you have questions about it, how it's being designed, Amanda and Dan have been working on that more than me. Um, regulatory revisions, I don't want to beat this too much. We've, we've already been over this. Um, we had an executive order that was done in 2012. The idea was to you know, get rid of the license requirement um, for people that are harvesting lionfish for a specific year. It also eliminated the default recreational bag limit, which is 100 pounds or two fish, which is, which is a greater amount. So those things have been done. There are Obviously, other things from a regulatory standpoint that can be done, and that's part of what we need to get from this uh, summit meeting as well, is uh, good ideas on the next steps in removing barriers, regulatory barriers. Um, 2013, the executive orders are designed to expire, and so we actually embedded the same provisions into the, the rules, which, which makes them permanent. Um, in terms of interagency coordination, that's kind of a broad topic that all the divisions in FWC that are involved with lionfish, we're all involved in coordinating and communicating with other agencies. So I don't, I don't have a whole bunch of detail on that, but that's another, another way that we can help facilitate lionfish control. So that's about all that I had to offer. That's kind of an overview of the programs and things that we've done, but I want to skip back to the social media and let Alicia come up and she can talk sensibly about what we've done and what we can do in the future, probably more importantly. But thank you all. Yeah, thank you. Saving you from yourself. <laughs> Well, I'm Alicia, and I work with the social media, and lucky enough, it is the best job in the whole entire world to work social media for FWC, because I feel like I get to do something great, and just by helping others and educate them. So that's 
that's the thing, or letting them know that there's something else out there that they need to be aware of. But I love that. So what we need is just the material in order to put it out there. Because social media is a big, giant, sucking machine that eats every piece of information you get. It. So if you're thinking that you like have something valuable, offer and pass on to us. I'd love to get it up, just like we do our website. If you have any events, we'd love to run it. We have Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, Pinterest. There's a whole host. YouTube. We're live streaming on YouTube right now. Marine Fisheries is one of my favorite divisions of the agency because they let me do all sorts of crazy things. Dan's like, what's the newest thing? Let's do it. And I'm like, OK, I'm going to figure it out. So we, we do, and we try to, try to get it going and make it look good and get the information out there. So we did our first ever Lionfish chat, first ever Twitter chat. And we, in that day, got more than 30,000 individual Twitter accounts that had our hashtag FWC Lionfish, which we happen to be using again today. So 30,000 people who may never have even heard of Lionfish on Twitter got to see at that hashtag. And if you don't know Twitter, it is like a totally different language. So all you have to do at this point is be really impressed. <laughs> 30,000, that's great. To make it even more exciting, today alone with that hashtag, we received over 20,000 hits and 20,000 accounts that were reached today with the Lionfish Summit information we're putting out there. Every speaker that has come up here, we have tweeted information out up on what you have said in order to help educate people and get them motivated to do something about it. I actually got a tweet back today that said, yeah, we get it, lionfish equal bad. <laughs> yes! So then I get to go home and feel great about what I did. I feel like I did something. But it really wasn't me, it was you guys. So we want to take your information and get it out there. We also have Facebook with over 27,000 followers right now, which might sound like a lot again, be impressed. Ooh. Or it may not sound like a lot, but we're always trying to get more followers. The more followers we have, the more people we can influence. Over 7 million people have seen an FWC message on Facebook as of today. On Instagram, we were also able to do a first with um, marine fisheries and our lionfish contest. You saw we gave away t-shirts for lionfish. If they showed us a photo of a lionfish, they got out of the water or speared in the water, we sent them a t-shirt, which is awesome. We call them limited edition t-shirts. So when we do the next round of t-shirts, we'll have another limited edition t-shirt and can win another one by getting some more. We've also made some very important contacts within the, uh, well, within Florida. Rachel Bowman is, she's amazing. She goes out there and gets so many lionfish. It's unbelievable. She sent us photos via Instagram and we hooked up with her. Amanda got her information and she signed a permission to use. Uh, and so we used the, her images that she's taken of her holding up these lionfish. And it makes people think, I can go do that myself. And so I think that's a really important thing to let people know that they can go out there and do it themselves. So we're here for education purposes and anything with social media, uh, don't talk to Alan. <laughs> <laughs> talk to me or find to Amanda. Amanda is awesome and she will let me know what I can help with and help you do. Thank you very much. <laughs> It's always nice to have somebody you know come up here who really loves what they do and, and expresses that you know, before everybody. At least that enthusiasm is effective. Thank you. Um, so uh, that concludes our, our management series of presentations this afternoon. We have a 15 minute break. Um, and uh, when we get back, we're going to be doing some, a little bit of heavy lifting you guys are going to contribute. So it's all, about, uh, it's all about you from here on out today. Um, so please uh, go out, rest, do what you need to do, and come on back and we'll get started. Okay? Thanks to all of our speakers one more time.
Mm. Yeah, we can, and or we can just answer. Well, maybe you can ask. Somebody had a um, panhandle. Uh, was that candy that had where the areas of lion kick were in the panhandle? Hi. I did not. Well, they're all over. It's, it's not a I would love to. Place. Are you going to be there um, right after the event? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so if I come with my uh, truck guy, can you put together like a minute of telling me, talking me through the Somebody did say they're seeing more people. Okay, I'll okay, meet you over there after. Okay. More like this or people. Hi. Ah, uh, yes, possibly. We have 500,000 baseball guys think shooting Yeah, that's great. Yeah, we, we have Ben Stone has been, he's come to a couple of the derbies and yeah. he's, he's even in one of the ones in Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. United doesn't want an office. That would be a no. Yeah, it seems like there is a little. There's a disconnect between the outpost and the outpost. The outpost is the inside of it. It's just two separate entities. The outpost is the licensing division. Under the mayor's office. Do you have to have this social media channel? I know. We are too. Those are all licensing. We have our own accounts Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Rich is about Facebook. We want to get it out to the masses. Yeah, and the success of the business is one message. Love it. Thank you. Yes, I'll be glad to help anyway. Great to meet you. Hey, Alicia, I have a question. Yes. I mean, there is no denying the reach and the power of social media. But how do you guys address getting information? Because to me, that's one of the biggest problems in social media. It's if anybody can post anything, it goes right through and Amanda. Out, and I blame Amanda awesome. for everything. So anything marine so fisheries. Things, so things like the thing that you've been retweeting, people's right. stuff, everything goes through her before it goes out? Almost. There's some there's some things that don't that yeah. are really, really obvious that I just retweet. Yeah. And I'll just, you know, if it doesn't have an article attached to it, if they're just, you know, it, it depends on what it is. But by far and large, if there's any question at all, it goes right to Amanda. So Amanda is kind of the... She's our gatekeeper. Okay. And to, yeah, I because wish, she's got contact with everybody in the agency, so. Yeah, I wish, I wish more social media had some mechanism for that. To me, and, that's one of the biggest... Issues. Yeah. So once, once the misinformation starts, oh yeah, you can't, it's so but hard to stop. And rumors. it just goes crazy, and then everybody has the wrong info. Right, and so that's that, we haven't done that. Let me tell you. <laughs> cool. Yeah. All right. I was going to say, I'm not a communication person. Yeah, we've been working on it. Believe it or not, I've been probably about just as much time. Yeah, we've been working with James Morris. Oh, yeah. Jeff's on for the last three years over the Bahamas. It's hard. What are the top things that you're saying? You know, it comes in a lot of different ways. I think it's a good thing. Maybe in your conferences. Yeah, we have a lot of time. So there's no, there's no yeah, so be, I mean, no even via traditional media, no several times we yeah, have articles say yeah, line fish are definitely line fish are poisonous. We had one today that there's there's yeah, one that says, oh yeah, there's that's just, that's just venomous facts. Single tail is a whole other thing. Feeding lines for predators. I do know some things that are working on. Really, all the way around, and that's also why when I write a, a Facebook post for something, I send it back through Amanda too because I'm not a biologist. I would have to know everything about the agency, you know, because we do panthers and manatee, and then you know, then we have. 
a little, a little bit of vetting information. Right. So I still have to, even if I write something from a press release, like you said, you switch things around, it could be something totally different. Unfortunately, I mean, via social media anyway, which is what I don't know. I'm seeing a lot less information, a lot less bad information. It's the, it, it, it definitely are the, the folks writing the articles, you know, the, the news reporters that get a lot of that really bad stuff. I mean, I, I make more comments on the bottom of them. We've been trying to try kinds of articles like, hey, it's not poisonous, poisonous, tends to make people believe that eating these things are good for them, blah, blah, blah. Right. Um, yeah. Scott Rowe with uh, yeah. Very nice to meet you. And I forgot to do a shout out for Ugly Fish Do you know who that is? Yeah, that's um, so much more. Um, so all right, I definitely want to say hi to her too because yeah, she's been tweeting. So I'm like, oh, I want to talk about. I want to. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, all right, I got to meet her too. Killing anything, right? The diet. And we've had a faction of our social media where we have a lionfish page, and a regular page. Yes. And that's even in general, we're talking about because, you know, all our members are important to us, but not everybody wants to be. That's about a year ago, we used to fire those battles all the time. Where you guys promoted killing lionfish hunters, and now we're going to kill them. Right now, we may get one. Negative. Yeah. I want to talk to more. It's really good. I mean, it's right. really tasty. And then now you know if someone, if someone makes a comment well, we like, why do you kill all those pretty fish? It's terrible. It's brutal. Totally brutal. I think it's brutal. You know, it's brutal. I think it's brutal. It is. Now I know whenever I see you, I'm like, all right, I know who he is. Yay. Yeah, I just tweeted at you too. I'm sure you got that. Yep. That's the one I just pulled up. And Ugly Fish just did another one. I did tweet your guys this stuff. Okay. I told you I would. Right. That's what I do. Yeah. I always look for stuff. So give it to me if you have it. Check out the website too. Yeah. Really, uh, I'm information to a bad one here at a time. What we try to do is we try to get a spill of information make it available in a pretty easy to find format. Let's put it all in one place. Yeah. And the thing that both of you guys know about is that Noah portal is being a large So, the thought behind that, the thought, well, behind the Noah portal, it's like the one stop shop for recreational neighbors, researchers, teachers, and everything. So, that's being built to be released by the end of the year. But once that's up, unfortunately, there's not really a social media side of it. Someone is not doing that on a basis. So, but it's a good place for you to grab content and always send that out as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like there's certain things I was saying before like, to the lab. I'm like, well, there's certain things that I can just run like that. You know, when I when we have a reputable person with a reputable website, then I can I know I can already get it or grab stuff and use it. Sure. That doesn't I, I love the whole idea. It's a reputable thing. You know, it's got you got to, it's got the information has to be better. Yeah. But, but, but I will tell you. I but I will tell you. I don't mind. Oh yeah, yeah, and I'm not saying we never did it either, because I mean that did happen. Nice job with your uh, uh, getting it out there. Yes. Have you uh, approached Scuba Board or Spear Board? That I don't know for sure. I know I have it. Amanda would be the person to talk to about that. And not standing here right now. Okay. But Amanda was yeah. the the one, and uh, okay. she's the one who vets our our material. Okay. As far as that goes. Yeah. yeah. Scuba board gets out to about two hundred thousand. Yeah. It, that that is it's a lot. All, and I mean, uh, they're always this, this type of thing just gets eaten up by the spear board. Right. So I don't do much with them, but they've got a really big problem. Leisure Pro every once in a while will do will RT one of our posts, but yeah. we need to get more in with the divers. You are absolutely correct. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody there is pretty static. Yeah. Okay. And I'm a diver too, but I'm one of those 20%. I've never killed anything, but I think I could now. 
Hey, no matter what, I, I, I've, I've taken a lot of pictures. Me too. I shoot them. Pictures. And i got to say, I've never seen a lionfish in our water. Really? Yeah. Where was that? I've, I've been diving all over the place, but um, not up. But not not here. I haven't seen a lot of this year. I've seen a lot of this year. Yeah. Well, I haven't been this year. Yeah. I've been I haven't so for two years. It's killing me. Okay. So who do I gotta talk to? Amanda. And yeah. Oh, that's what we're on. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> There are uh, tanks. There's only tanks that are actually So, those are three areas that Thank you. 
so that I can do my Right now, Okay, well, I'm going to to get everyone back to their seats again. We're going to do some more rallies. And those who have to be here to win, so pull out your raffle tickets. So, what do we Now we've got some great raffle items from uh, person. We've got some gloves and uh, some dye knives. I see some excitement out there for that. So, uh, I'll pause the numbers. Those of us who are in here on at your seats, the last three digits of the first ticket number is 178. 178. 192. 192 in the room. 169. What did I do? All right. We've got uh, for lot of you got prison, camouflage gloves. Uh, congratulations, Lot. We also have uh, for Chrissy guideline. Last three digits 160. 160. 160? Ticket one seven three. All right. Right on the Pinellas County is the crowd winner of the first time. So I got to trade my ticket now. Ticket one seven three. I'll be verifying this. Congratulations, Mike. We still have another dive night ticket. Two five four. Two five four. All right. And your name, sir? Yeah. Yay. Joe, I'm winning that time. Thank you, everyone, for getting back to your seats. We also, uh, you know, some people are having to leave for other meetings and such, so we wanted to remind everyone we have a box that we're putting up by the registration area for your Google evaluation forms. Uh, it's broken down into the uh, basically follows along the agenda. So any box that you've seen or the different segments, please help us evaluate that and place it in the box uh, as you leave. So we're ready to start the next segment. Uh, does everyone where's, where's my uh, my co uh, moderator? I don't see I don't see Kent here. But so we're going to the next item on the agenda is a discussion of preferred desired future condition. Okay, everyone settle down here. So, uh, can we can you maybe close the you either have people come in or close the door so we can get the session started here? Vanessa? Thank you, Candy. So during this during this session, I see people continue to file and Yeah, thank you, we're running seven minutes behind, so I do want to get us back on schedule again. Our objective during this um, session is to talk about, the, to look back at our uh, desired future condition. You see that we pasted it up there. Again, this is what we were presented uh, yesterday. And we identified them uh, A through F, is just so for the purposes of uh, if you guys had some questions or comments or want to discuss any of those particular and future conditions further. We want to revisit this so we make sure we're, you know, this is where we would like to move forward into the future. So, uh, you know, the first one, the first item there, uh, the 
Desired future condition of flora where the lionfish population is controlled, so there is no negative impact to native fish and wildlife populations in their habitats. The general public knows about the negative ecological and social impacts of lionfish and is knowledgeable about what to do when they encounter them. FWC is exercising leadership and co-manages lionfish collaboratively with state sister agencies, non-governmental organizations, and stakeholders. Stakeholders are engaged and empowered to implement appropriate management actions. Stakeholder influence leads to political and financial support for a broad and adaptive suite of management actions, and where the presence of lionfish causes no negative economic impacts. So we'd like to capture here, among those of you who are in attendance, uh, suggestions towards desired future conditions, perhaps that we've, that we've overlooked uh, or maybe that need to be added. Uh, we don't necessarily want to get into a word smithing uh, <clears throat> exercise with this with such a large group. But if you see desired future conditions that you feel maybe aren't uh, capturing the you know, the way it should be captured, we would like to capture, you know, talk about that as well. Aaron will be recording for us and we'll be capturing these thoughts uh, on, onto the, the Word document. So, with that, uh, Kent is walking around with the microphone and, can, and Dan also. So, uh, we'll start with uh, Chris Stallings and uh, some, of, some of your first thoughts on, on the desired future condition. All right, and again, we ask everybody to stand up so um, we can capture your face and smiling, you know, <laughs> busy edge on these, on these uh, images. Um, I'm just wondering for number C, or letter C, um, where the academic uh, realm is. I mean, is that where universities would fit in? It's just not clear to me. And then additionally, where does research specifically fit in? Okay, so there's a the comment there. I can see to consider including universities and research. And I, I don't know if research would specifically go under C, but um, I would hope that the future condition involves a floor where research on the lionfish issue is important. So we've captured that with a statement considering adding academia and research. Chris, does that yep. uh, capture your comment? Okay, we had we had a second comment along those lines. Okay, we have a comment there now. Right. Well, obviously, lionfish are a problem here in Florida, but um, when you look at the bigger picture, uh, the lionfish doesn't know where the international boundaries are between, say, Florida and the Bahamas, moving south to our neighbors in Mexico and beyond. Uh, I think it's exceptionally important for us to work across these international boundaries and that may you know exceed the capability of our, our uh, session here but it seems to me that that is something that somebody in our government maybe the state department i don't know how that would work but to coordinate the efforts of people and regulations in places like the bahamas or uh, when you're visiting the caymans or going to dive in honduras or mexico if if everybody was playing off the same sheet of music, and everybody had the same focus on the eradication of lionfish, uh, we would actually make a lot more progress. If you're a visitor to one of those countries and they take away your spear in, in transit, uh, you're obviously not going to be able to do anything. The, the essence is, um, it makes sense to me to have somebody focusing on international cooperation and standardization of regulations across the international borders on this topic. Not sure if anybody's been working on that, but it seems like a really smart idea. Thanks. Okay, so we captured that. Uh, we work across international boundaries, coordinate efforts, and rules regulations with other countries regarding lionfish. Okay, and I think uh, just to just to verify that that may be under C with our work with collaborative collaboratively with our sister agencies because NOAA has that authority to be able to work across those borders um, and FWC can certainly uh, you know, assist with, with helping develop some of the concepts there but uh, our, our authority doesn't extend beyond the state of Florida but I, but I think that's a very valid consideration and I just want to make sure we, we have captured it here and we'll check back to make sure we've got that and what we're looking at. Okay we've got, we've got another one over here. 
this might also have to do with what I see it has to do with research. And my, my comment is is there a way to fit in the uh, community groups that are working with Lionfish? Because I think that a big impact for research and for activities in the field uh, could be with the help of community groups and specifically in open science projects that many researchers sometimes are a bit hesitant to bring in because they might consider that opening up the project would endanger bonds of grants. So I don't know if there is a way to put that in there or if that is contained. That sounds like another item C uh, comment. Is there a way to fit in community groups working with mine Thank you. So I guess my um, recommendation or what I'd like to see happen is further easing the restrictions on spear fishing in state waters for uh, possibly around bridges and jetties, that sort of thing, uh, because we know that the lionfish are not just seven, you know, not just seven miles offshore, not just around the, the reef pyramids and the artificial reefs that we put in in North Florida, but I personally saw many, many lionfish over the last weekend just diving around some of the uh, breakwaters uh, in the marinas. And my understanding is that that's kind of a no-go for, for spear fishing. So, uh, and then also I saw some under the you know, bridge as well. You know, I, I see those kinds of things and it breaks, there's just nothing I can do about that. So I'd like to see that under, under A. Okay, so we've, we've captured that, uh, that, and that, that might be perhaps an item under E, or E, maybe. And uh, I, think we're, I think we may be moving a little bit more towards some of the recommended management actions too here, so, and, and that's, that's fine. I mean, we can, we can kind of merge over there, because we're going to do that next, and we don't want to lose that. Um, uh, and we'll make sure we look at that relative to our desired future condition. Um, let's try to focus as much as we can on kind of that that perfect Florida, perfect uh, lionfish situation in Florida as much as we can. Isn't that what we're talking about? The, the desired future condition. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. I, maybe we should make a distinction between the discussion we're having now, which is on the desired future conditions, where we want the future to be, versus the next session that's starting at three thirty, which is just ten minutes from now, that, uh, where we'll talk about policy and regulation and such. So. I think we'll, we'll capture some of those specifics. So, right, where are we going from there? We can talk about Bob, and then we'll go to Mark. Thank you. Uh, with these uh, desired future conditions, do we have, do we feel we have to cover to address issues with U.S. customs as far as uh, further imports of fish and things that can possibly be done to prevent future invasions of, uh, say, if we uh, get the right fish under control? Try to stop it from happening, or some other successful fish come in the future. As far as you know, possibly sterilization of those fish in a condition come coming into the country. So if they do get out, they will have this problem again. So in that case, the desired future condition would be no further uh, invasive species. <coughs> you know, let's make lionfish the last marine invasive species that we see, perhaps. So. Uh, Important, you know, and that would be through coordination with the U.S. Customs. But the desired future conditions that we have that is that we have no further introduction of non-native invasive species. Good. Okay. Uh, the next question, I think, Mark. Uh, um, yeah, I was just thinking about a, which you know, we're talking about the language population being controlled, so there are no negative impacts on native wildlife populations. I think that. It's really important to make this list realistic, and I don't know that no negative impact is realistic, but I think that it brings up a really important point, which is that we have to set some kind of minimum acceptable condition in terms of the impact on our native species that we're willing to accept. And there's going to be obviously a trade off between cost of mitigation and the results of that mitigation. Um, the mitigation is probably never going to get us to zero impact, I, I don't think, personally. Um, but I think that it is important for us to have an open discussion about what is an acceptable level of impact because we're going to have to accept some. some. I think those, those are all excellent uh, comments. We've captured that, that no negative impact. 
It's not realistic to find them at the central level in fact to native marine organisms and habitats. And again, a desired future position would be this in an absolutely ideal world. So it may be that some of these might not be achievable, but it will help us do our best to strive towards it with, with the best management actions that we can. We have on the right hand side, yes. Um, actually, along the same lines, uh, it might even change to a positive impact because uh, why not make it into a harvestable resource as the uh, fishermen suggested, uh, make it a tourist industry thing. Um, even drawing up there, you know, when I traveled to uh, New Zealand, they were selling the tails of uh, Australian possums, which are an extremely detrimental species, but yet they turned around and made a fur industry out of it, made a tourist uh, product out of it. And, uh, you know, for, for everything, yes, there's, there's bad, but, uh, you know, if, if you can get a tourist to fly down from New York City to, you know, spearfish, lionfish, that's a net benefit to uh, the dive operator. So maybe it's a situation, yes, we're paying some control, uh, but if it, if it is uncontrollable, which uh, the depths we're talking about, it's not controllable. Okay, you know, it's, it's just not, we may be controlling the short stuff, but uh, um, any sort of thing like this, it's, it's a resource. And uh, find some way to make, uh, make a profit off of it, and that's the fisherman's, uh, fisherman's opportunity there. So, so the desired future condition there that we've captured is that I guess there would be a, a commercial industry created for a, a positive versus a negative situation, turn it into something that makes makes a profit. Okay, thank, thank you. And I'm, just, I'm just following up, um, I guess, on both of those questions. And, and I had the same reaction that, that Mark did. This is more of a question just for FWC. In terms of the legal aspects of this, um, is there something that FWC is going to be held to that they can then be sued in case somebody can make a case that, well, there has been a negative impact shown? And I, I don't know, I don't know, you know, where the litigious aspect of a future desired condition, desired future. <laughs> Desire. Desire. <laughs> this, you know, this is a concept, and and Ken can chime in too. That, you know, this is something that we've been learning in recent years. You know, our agency is moving us to, to to engage stakeholders more. So this is one of our agency processes that we've been utilizing to facilitate the discussion. You know, the language that we're putting up here is. is it's not a regulation or a standard, I think, or anything that would that would uh, you know be put forth that would uh, elicit some sort of litigation standard. But it's provoking these the desired future conditions are provoking the discussion that we can then take the next step and think about management actions. So to help us develop some guidelines and help us move forward, but most importantly, involve you, the attendees at the summit. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, just that uh, of all the divisions that are represented here, our, our legal group is not. So uh, <laughs> you know, we certainly can't speak as large, although as a biologist, I never thought it would be trained in law. I think really we are to a large degree working in the agency to some degree because uh, we all have to be um, you know, at least aware of, of, of how our actions influence things in relation to this contiguous you know, status really. um, So. The bottom line is, you know, Keith's right for engaging everybody in, in on this, uh, and we would really have to ask our law enforcement, uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry, wrong, 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 general counsel. Our general counsel uh, as to, you know, uh, kind of how to answer your question more, more directly. Um, we, can, we can do that in the long run, and perhaps provide that in some of the outputs of this report. From here, we have Candy. Okay, I have a couple things. Talking about all this, the general public needs to know the educational aspect on the lionfish page. It would be very helpful if you had a link that would take people directly to the lionfish research that has been uh, conducted, especially the lionfish research that's been uh, partially funded or fully funded by the FWC. Every bit of that should be on there. I did go to the FWC's research department 
And I looked for every single research paper that had been done for the past 28 years since they um, found out about the lionfish in the water, and I was stunned to find only one research paper. So when I uh, showed up here, I was pleased to see that there has been quite a bit of research, but I'm curious as to why that research is not available on the website and why it's not easily found. If you go to your website and type lionfish research, it will just kick you to a lionfish page that just tells you general information and you don't get to see the actual studies. So I think adding the research study links that show people exactly what studies have been done and the conclusions of those studies, I think that would be uh, very helpful. Thank you, Ken. I think that's one aspect to help us implement item B. The general public knows about the negative and ecological and social impacts of blind vision is knowledgeable about what to do when we encounter them. So perhaps that could be a recognition to carry through to our outreach and education uh, discussion in the next session. Do we have a question, comment on Dan's side? Yes. Um, I think that the state of Florida should take a leadership role in organizing the other states <laughs> to have a summit like this because we're not on an island. There are the people in Texas that are diving are probably seeing a lot of fish. And if we've got limited resources, then why is each state going to spend their resources doing the same thing over and over again? So I think it's very narrow minded if we think that we should just confine ourselves to the state of Florida. Okay, we're capturing that too. And I, I think that's that's another example of a of a management recommendation too. So Kind of following up on so the comment here is that Florida State got a leadership role in organizing other states to coordinate lionfish research as well. And I think with that comment, Kent and I we were talking we should move in just since we're already talking about matching you know, some of the specific action items, moving into the next phase of, of this uh, brainstorming session. And uh, that is bringing us to if you want to yeah. Well, I mean, we could, we're, we're, Keith and I are co-managing this right now. So what we'd like to do is kind of break down uh, these management discussions into components. And uh, don't want to interrupt the other the other members that there were two other people that wanted to speak. So are you all speaking directly to the desired future condition issue? Let's capture that one last one. Okay. Okay. No, no, that's okay. 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 So Dorothy will. Yes, I was just seeking clarification. Um, and we had this discussion last night about why economic was uh, separated from the ecological and social. But actually, I'm unclear what you mean by social impacts. And so um, I would just like some clarification if that's meant to be public health impacts or if it is social. I don't know what social means. Which, right? which I don't know either. Item B. Uh, social impacts, I think uh, the word social is every year, so I don't know if anybody really knows what you're talking about. So, I think we could be more specific. I think we could go broader than just maybe how it's unambiguous. And, and I think the social impacts that we're talking about that are things like human health, um, you know, related to um, venomation, secretary, so public, public health is one of the components of the social elements. There might be other things that might be other things related to um, you know, cultural stories use of the of, of the animal or those kinds of things would also be considered in that kind of social category. So people from the Indo Pacific come here and use them in some capacity. Um, it, it happens a lot with uh, the base of the plant plants, for instance, certain, certain species people will, will use them for medicinal purposes and other things. So along those lines. It tries to capture all that. <laughs> yeah, so do we have another desired future condition comment? Yes, I do. Yes. Uh, Dan was bringing the mic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just in regard to what was just mentioned about the FWC taking a leadership role in this, I think uh, you already have just by doing the summit, but uh, you're in a unique position to do that. We've got Justin McCauley, who heads up the Marine Fisheries Division for the state, uh, is a member of the South Atlantic Council, and then Martha Bagrin, who works under her uh, supervision, is a seated member on the Golf Council. Uh, we've got so many opportunities to explore successful methods. For example, we have a, a, a black sea bass pop fishery up off the Mid Atlantic, and uh, I don't know what their results are or interactions with lionfish, but if they're anywhere even remotely close, 
to what we're doing in the lobster fishery, it could be substantial. Um, if we're going to coordinate this effort, I think that, that Florida would be ideally poised to do that, having the most shoreline out of all of the states, both in the Gulf and South Atlantic, that membership on both of the councils and so forth, and they certainly have the ear of uh, the no administration on these things. Then secondly, uh, as we're doing these things, we're reaching out uh, cooperative research programs with industry, similar to what the Reef.org and our organization has done. You have so much more exposure, you can get more accomplished in, in a shorter period of time doing repeated actions over time that are measurable and at much less cost than if just science alone would tackle this because of the cost involved in deploying NOAA ships and, and research vessels when our guys are out there each and every day of the week. So uh, this, we're coming up with some very interesting and poignant ideas that I could work well, I think would work very well to address this situation. Thank you. Thank you. I, and I think that comment also works well in moving us I think, forward into the next the next section. So if everyone uh, looks at your, your agenda, you'll see those different items. Um, the policy and regulation. Of course, we've already spoken about research. I went through that exercise. Now we're going to talk about policy and regulation, uh, control strategies, education and outreach, and then other actions. And so as we did with the research section, we would like to identify gaps or, or management actions that we could list out under each of those categories. So looking at those categories, the first one is policy and regulation. I think earlier uh, we already had a, a recommendation for a management uh, for an action or a regulatory action that could fall under that category. So we'll stop uh, we'll start with the, the policy and education when Aaron is ready. Uh, we'll populate maybe in either a new document or a new page, policy and regulation, and then we'll begin to work down kind of capturing where the audience thinks there might be some gaps and then the action items that, that we could be moving towards. So are, are we going to break and like move out into the crowd? Is that how we just like to pursue this one take that side? We'll make sure we look here for the All right, so to the left. All right, so the whole idea here is we, you know, um, Keith and I are going to work out in the crowd here, come up and work with you on these ideas, make sure we can develop these into, uh, into comments and actions that, uh, uh, that, that we can actually list and, and that we can work on uh, prioritizing again tomorrow. We're going to have these, all, all these that we come up with, we're going to have written up on, on both sides of the room, and people will have the opportunity to select which ones they feel are the most important. And we'll develop a prioritized list of these actions as a result. Okay, so your contributions here are critical. Um, we'll capture. We can start fresh right now on these on these different ones, but we'll make sure to capture any of the management concepts that you've already provided back down in these when we polish these up later this evening. Okay, so worry not. Anything that's management that, that's already been stated, we'll pull into the appropriate category, and we'll include uh, in those in those management. Uh, Actions. So right now we're working on policy and regulation. Policy and regulation. Okay. We got one up top. Lan? Yeah. Sam? Uh, I'm not sure if this is um, implied already, but I think development of a formal written line fish management plan by the state would be really important. Not just coming up with internal strategies, but having a formal document. That people can look at and see what what the plans are. Excellent formal management plan, and would that be in in cooperation with our partners as well, right? Looking back at our desired future condition, obviously you know, the business doesn't have the resources to do it all. Working together with partners to achieve those goals. Okay. Any other questions? I'd like to hammer you guys on topic that Scott brought up a few minutes ago. Uh, relaxing the regulations uh, in regards to scuba diving, spearfishing around bridges, jetties, inlets, and intercoastal waterways. We're seeing the flying fish turning the corner, they're coming in the inlets, they're turning the corner, going miles up to the estuary, which is already under great attack. 
Uh, we need to get proactive on that. I mean, you guys are just uh, essentially by not allowing us to do this, you're creating wine fish nurseries. That's something we all want to avoid. Uh, number two, if I may, one more. Uh, rebreathers. I've got a handful of dive buddies that are willing to risk the danger of hunting live fish on these breathers at great depths. Uh, you guys need to let them do that. Okay? It's, it should be a stroke of a thing, really. That's not a problem. Thank you very much. Good stuff. Good, stuff. Good contributions. Other regulation policy and regulation items. Uh, just like talk about traps, it's been brought up several times as one of the large possible methods for the future, but we live in a state where we can't use traps. And like to see some sort of protocol for private individuals to be able to experiment, test with traps that we can help develop this. Um, otherwise, we're limiting ourselves to just publicly funded groups who are the only ones who are going to be willing to experiment with traps. Did we, yeah, did we capture that uh, create protocol to allow private individuals to experiment with traps? Um, I work as a contractor for no National Marine Fisheries as a port sampler, and I talk to the commercial fishermen a lot, and I feel like a lot has been taken away from them. And I'm wondering if maybe some kind of way of helping getting them on board is because money talks for them. If maybe they can get some sort of discount on their license as the commercial fisherman or as the wholesale dealer. Like if they catch a certain amount of lionfish a year and if a dealer buys lionfish at all, if maybe they can get whatever monetary discount on their license that they have to renew every year. All right, let's make sure we capture this again. Um, correctly provide discounts to commercial fishermen and wholesalers if they sell line fish. Is that? Yes, yeah, sell, sell and catch, catching and selling line fish. If they <coughs> sell, catch and sell. I think it's yeah, financial discount for their license, for license fees or something like that. If they catch and sell, is that FWC or no? Uh, FWC or no? Sorry, I actually don't know the answer to that. Dan may. I think it's I think it's FWC. Yeah, it's FWC. Okay, we've got Adam. Oh, sorry. <coughs> um, several things that have kind of come to uh, maybe a, a common uh, mechanism. We've talked about regulation, and we've also talked about lack of funding. It was the market that got us into this situation for lionfish, and there's certainly nothing new. FWC has been dealing with numerous invasive species. We've got a lot of plant invasive species. Maybe the way to, to get a, a little bit ahead of the next invasion and give us something to work with in terms of, of, of funding is to have a, a market um, Product that or a market el element of a uh, impact fee on on invasives or exotic species that are coming into the state. So that, you know, I know you have to probably work with the Florida legislature there, but instead of trying to ban something, maybe work with the market and give yourself something to work with in terms of the funding as well. Okay, so do we get that? Develop um, instead of a ban, maybe a, an impact fee for imports. Okay. Non so instead of a ban, an impact fee. A ban. Yeah, yeah. Imports. Okay, yeah. Okay. Impact fee on the basis of the work of the state. Yeah, I work with the legislature, whatever, to develop one. I've got Lad over here, too. Yeah, I was thinking something on a similar line to, to what Robert said, but, but maybe not the import fee, but actually considering restriction of importation of species that have high risk of on the base of this. And I don't think that's been on the table yet. Maybe that would be a starting point. The fallback would be, there you go. <laughs> um, they'll tell what she said on the commercial side and stuff also. I understand FWC doesn't have, has very limited funds and such. 
from a recreational side, if you turn around and said the recreational spear fisherman brought in 50 line fish, there would be allowed one allocation of one additional red snapper fish or one additional grouper allocation that day. If they also turned in 50, 100, whatever line fish for that. It gives them, they're already down there, already spear fishing, gives them that incentive. Go ahead, get that extra line fish while turning around and they're also getting um, a red snapper. And we're kind of capturing that as a bounty on line fish reward would be increased. Thank you. Yeah. For recreational. For recreational. Yeah. So we want to go to the other side and then back to the Yeah, I was going to quickly say that uh, I was also kind of found the idea too, rather than the discount on the license that they'll offer these guys a bounty, say for 100 pounds, we get $5, $10, whatever back. Rather than trying to deal with the license fee structure on that, just simply offer a bounty for for commercial sites that say wholesalers or work with wolves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, got another one. Yep. Going back to the idea of restricting importation of species that have high risk of becoming invasive. Um, you guys might be familiar with the model already established by Harbor Branch, Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institution. Several years ago, they established a uh, basically hatchery for uh, bombfish, and they provided an alternate market for the commercial importation of bombfish. Uh, and of course, something I mean, they talked to those folks about what they've done and how that could be tied into this idea of restricting importation of species. You're providing an alternate market, or maybe the only market for the aquarium trade would be captured local lion fish uh, as opposed to importation. So, provide an alternate. And another thought would be well, a different note would be kind of going back to the idea of international travel. Um, if a diver who's a spear fisherman has experience uh, with lion fish, um, could have a certification of some sort, perhaps a certificate of proficiency uh, that they might be able to take to another country. If, if another country is uh, hesitant to allow spear fishermen in, uh, who might be interested in targeting blind fish, let's say, in Cayman's, uh, if you have a certificate issued by the state of Florida or by some agency here that would be authoritative, show that you're proficient, show that you know how to operate a weapon, and that you have a discipline to use it properly, uh, that might be uh, conducive to allowing people to cross borders and have uh, a certificate of proficiency, something like that. Okay. Yeah, it's, we just want to make sure we, you know, we have two points there: that captured lord lionfish versus imported lord lionfish, right? And then the second concept was. Uh, Establishing a spear fishing certification that we recognize that site. Just to touch on that, what about if, because these other countries are not going to just do this for the lion fish reason, a monetary thing like if, if the United States can offer, Florida for instance, offer a license, but part of that money is a special license and the money goes to that country. So you can get a license here to say that we're allowed to do, do spear fishing. Of lionfish in the Cayman Islands, and then the Cayman Island government would get a piece of that money for every permit or license that was sold in the U.S. That gives more of a of a reason. Another thing I want to point out is everyone's talking about spare fishermen. Everyone's talking about fishing. But there's a lot of recreational divers that are not fishermen. They really don't have a desire to. But if we could do some kind of incentive program or educate um, captains of, of recreational dive boats to do something with the lionfish, a spearfishing expedition or something like that. Every time I look at a recreational dive boat, there's nothing for, for, for lionfish that's not you know, a diving uh, uh, um, spear fisherman's you know, uh, activity. So something in that, in that realm. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm going to make it real simple. Um, let's make uh, lionfish part of the Freshman Florida Incentive Program. And uh, 
you know, induce retailers to handle them, uh, give the fishermen, the retailers something back for, for doing this, and put them on the program. I mean, let's get rid of these damn things. <laughs> Bob Space, Southern Offshore Fishing Association. One question, is that on the Florida trip tickets? Is there lying fish listed on there? And is it on the federal dealer's reporting system? It's on right uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, it is on both? Okay. Uh, because I thought, I know we'll have some uh, some interest in the commercial side if we get the harvest level of catch per unit effort and the offshore waters, et cetera, so we can see how those populations are doing that we can't see. I think one of the things that everybody in this room wants to think about as we're making all these regulation suggestions is regulations are the biggest expense that the FWC has. And I'll let you let that sink in for just a second. The FWC's annual budget is around $300 million a year in order to enforce all of the regulations that are made cost over one third of their entire annual budget. And they spend $113 million on law enforcement to enforce those regulations. So as you're thinking about, do we have enough money for this? Or do we have enough money for that? Every time the regulators increase regulations, that's less money that we have for things that can actually make an impact and make a difference. So that's one point that I'd like to make there. As far as the fishery management, I think it's extremely important that fishery management be seen as taking a proactive role in this crisis, and they need to be seen as approachable by the general public. And some of the things that people are bringing up over and over again with the rebreathers and the line fish showing up under bridges and jetties and so forth. The FWC needs to move quickly on these things because it's a uh, public relations nightmare that is brewing. And as people see in action, then they get angry. And a lot of the talk today has been about you know, working with the public and working with the stakeholders. When you make the stakeholders angry, they're not going to work with you. And so they need to see swift action, they need to see results, and they need to see positive things happening. And so it's very important that as you're approaching the general public, you need to understand that every time you're putting more and more, like for example, the um, executive order that took the fishing licensing requirement away, they did not just take the fishing license and the requirement away. They added regulations on how you can fish for line fish if you don't have a license. It really should not matter what tools you use to kill a lion fish if you don't have a license. It should only matter that you kill the lion fish. And we already have laws and regulations in effect that say if you don't have a license and you have a red snapper in your box, you're in trouble. So what difference does it make? And why do we need to regulate the tools that people use to do what we need them to do? We need to back off on that just a little bit. And we need to give people the freedom to go out there and make a difference. Because if we cannot recruit enough people in our state, in, in all these states, to help us with this problem, then we're going to be meeting here in two or three years and we're all going to be saying, we wish we would have done something proactive and we wish we would have lightened up just a little bit and supported the public. Okay, so let's put this into a comment that we can, we can incorporate into, into the document. That was, that was a lot of, there was a lot of verbiage there. It's good to get your point. But what we need to do is try to, try to capture this in a way. So I think, and, and I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but correct me if I'm wrong on this. Um, that you, what you want to say here is uh, we need to reduce um, uh, the. Uh, no, no, I, I don't believe it's impediments. It's, it's more really specifically related to the gear restrictions, isn't it? That's the gear restriction. The gear restriction. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. So reduce gear restrictions. Public needs to see proactive actions. Great. 
and yeah. publish. We can add that to that. Okay, so and we need to add population control as a state activity. Population control as a state activity. Okay, there's another action. We got um, Bill Jones. Yes, uh, I think with regard to any rules and regulations, uh, you know, we need to just clearly separate the recreational and commercial sectors here. Uh, we have very different applications here, and in a marketing scheme, we would encourage a recreational harvest for personal consumption. Uh, but when we look at the commercial side here, uh, we've got a lot of things that need to be considered, uh, uh, licensing and, and rules and regulations to the same proposed sectors. Uh, but the most important thing is product quality, <coughs> the compliance with asset controls here. We produce the safest seafood in the world because of that. Uh, and uh, these are issues that would have to be addressed not only for the fishermen, but that chain of custody through the, uh, the retail dealers as well to ensure quality. We have issues of ciguatera poisoning and Turks and Caicos, but we have no evidence of that up here. Those kinds of things need to have certain safeguards. So uh, in developing this, this uh, rules and regulations regimen, we need to apply all the principles that we use currently for our domestic cod fish. Okay, Chris over on this side. Let's make sure we capture bills. Oh, okay. All right, Scott Burrell, World Line Fish Hunters Association. Uh, RJ was nice enough to mention a couple times earlier. One of the things that um, I'd like to just touch on what Candy has to say. I think Candy's looking at it from a, a point that, you know, there's try to reduce the, the negative impacts of the negative um, tone that sometimes gets associated with rules and regulations and that sort of thing, right? So one of the things that my organization, we cover a much larger area than just Florida, we tend to look at the Caribbean and Latin America as well. And part of the success behind our organization is, is that we realize that there's a lot of motivation for people. And one of the motivations that we have touched on that have, seems to mobilize people, at least nearing social media, is a sense of competition. And it's a sense also that coming from an ecological standpoint, that lionfish hunters are oftentimes looked at as heroes amongst those people who are not in the water because they understand that for every lionfish that are removed from the water, so I'm saving a local fish, or I'm saving local crayfish, and if you use you know, uh, reefs, uh, kind of these, these kind of these mathematical formulas to have, you're saving somewhere between five crayfish and 22 one crayfish um, you know, per day for an entire year for lionfish, right? And I think a lot of people see what lionfish hunters can do with going into the water, or, you know, scuba diving is not exactly a uh, powder puff kind of sport, and uh, in dealing with lionfish or not either. So, with all of that being said, I think that we have a program that we're rolling out next month that we're calling a Heroes Program. And I think maybe the FWC could expand this, uh, you know, your social media effort that you use with you know, you turn in a picture of, a, of yourself with a, with a lionfish and they're pretty sure. Well, why not make an extension of the Florida's state records program to include lionfish? Um, you can do it both from, anglers, from an angler standpoint as well as at a spearfishing standpoint. And also recognize those guys and gals who are out there hunting lionfish and bringing them in and calling the Florida Girls program or something along those lines. Because one of the motivators that are going to get people in the water and hunting these lionfish in adverse conditions is recognition and very public recognition is at that. So, uh, you know, that's something that, that we've certainly been thinking about in our organization, but, you know, looking at the size and the enormity of, of FWC's machine, you, know, you guys should be able to take that and, and um, mobilize people to get in the water. Yeah, thank you. There was, there was a lot of comments there. And, uh, Aaron and I were kind of just consulting to see she, she identified some of the other categories that we have in this discussion. So um, I think a lot of what you say kind of falls under control strategies, outreach, um, and, ed and education. Of course, just to remind everyone, we still want to focus on the policy. I'll be recognizing that there's a lot of overlap with right. policy and regulations, what we're kind of moving through for the next. Two minutes, I think. Uh, actually, it's probably a good. That was probably a good segue to shift yeah. over into this because you know we you can kind of run we can run the gamut on each of these. And you can see in the crowd when you start shifting to different different areas, it's it's time. <laughs> so it's it's probably good for us at this point to just go ahead and, and start again with the control strategies 
and start working on, on, on focused actions that we need to do to control live fish. We've looked at the regulation um, uh, and uh, um, the regulation side of the equation. So now let's shift over to directed activities. And I think Scott does a, a great idea uh, along, those, uh, along those lines, trying to put something together in FWC to take potential leadership role in that. So control strategies. Do we have some ideas on different ways to control? I mean, again, I spoke about robots earlier. You know, that, you know maybe that's not that really far off. So. Okay, we got Jerry over here. Let me just go ahead and throw this one out. When lion fish get to X density on the bottom, that you allow a direct track fishery for lion fish. Someday you're going to have to do that when I put it up there. I'm not suggesting what X density is, a tap of the biota, or whatever level you think is the level that you pull the switch. We need to be developing the gear techniques, the licensing program, the controls, and everything, so that when X density is arrived at, we can get at it. Okay, uh, Jerry, you mentioned a couple of things that I want to make sure we capture. Uh, you also suggested that we develop you know, the gear, um, and we talked about licensing and rest in, the, in the restoration. Do we want to include something there for the gear? Okay. That's, you're going to have to have that in place to do a direct trap fishery, but there's no doubt. There's no doubt in my mind we're going to get there. I mean, if you look at the, uh, the, the movement pattern, particularly in the deeper water, um, it's just a matter of time as to when we implement this thing. Okay, I just want to develop effective language tracks. We want to include that too in there because I think that was part of it. Just want to capture everything and all the ideas. Staying on control strategies. Yeah, no robots. Not yet. Uh, I do think, though, that since um, such a broad area that's invaded, we should put some work into identifying and prioritizing sites for targeted removal efforts. Rather than just having widespread effort everywhere, let's identify those areas that need attention. Would, would there be any suggestion on, on perhaps, I mean, that's a general statement. Is there any suggestions that you might have on what those might be? Depends on the okay. Depends on the <clears throat> uh, yeah, just to follow up on that, I totally agree with that. I think that diffuse effort by a bunch of different parties and a bunch of using a bunch of different methods is not going to hurt. It's going to help overall. But I think what's really important, and what I think maybe the state needs to be more directly involved in, is regular funded removals at specific sites that you know are either marine protected areas or national parks or something along those lines. And uh, you know you can have this diffuse effort all over, but it's not going to make as much difference as very focused, intensive, repeated um, removals at certain sites. Excellent. Now we have a bunch of on this side, so let's just pass the mic over here. I think to build on what you're saying, even doing something like an adopted reef program where people can go out on their boat and be like, this is my reef, and we clean it up and remove lionfish, or it can donate to a program where FWC or reef or any other organization can have people who go out to specific sites regularly. Yeah. Maybe you need to be able to proactive and, and mapping potential areas for lionfish have lionfish invasion as well. Obviously, we've got a series of red dots that we see on several maps around. Maybe we need some yellow areas. We've heard talk about educating the estuaries for how far down the St. John's River or up the Calusa Hatchie or the Peace River or God knows what else are these things. We've heard that the Lox Hatchie are four miles in. How far can they get down the St. John's and one of our other major rivers? Again, you know, these need to be yellow areas to monitor. You can track to see if these critters are moving into those areas as well. Okay, so developing um, invasion threat maps. Yeah, something along those lines. Um, to add on to that adapt a reef program, maybe this is another opportunity to make another new Florida license tag where you can be a lionfish tag and part of the proceeds to go with helping with lionfish
Thanks. One of the interesting things that, that the more I learn about the, the transport mechanism for spreading the species is the eggs going to the surface and floating along with the current and then eventually settling just as is often the case with eggs. These, these eggs are unequal in the fact that they tend to form in a gelatinous glob, as I understand. This is kind of unusual. And I wonder if there's any way to interrupt that transport mechanism. And the thing that comes to my mind is and maybe it's totally unrealistic because of the scale or something else, but the methods that are used to control uh, oil spoil spills that are spreading such a boom for machines that you know the boats that control with surface scanners or something like that. If that if you can identify that there's a reef here that's that's maybe producing a lot of eggs and you have a lot of uh, egg masses coming to the surface in a particular area. If you could boom, if you could do something to interrupt the flow of eggs on the surface um, to interrupt the transport mechanism. I don't know if anybody's considered that, it's just totally really absurd, but it's something to think about more strongly. Yeah. Another one? Yeah. I just want to follow up with the um, prioritizing sites. Um, we have an, an analog with um, the National Park Service with the invasive terrestrial plants and all the different park units may not have enough resources to do their um, in-house plant treatments. So what we have is we call a um, small project pit squad and it's basically a team of four to six people that travels all throughout the state of Florida and in the Florida National Parks. And so it's much more cost effective and these are trained, you know, they become professional by the first training session. So, um, Recognizing that not everyone in you know, all these different kinds of teams in these kind of fields that have control, if we have these priority spots, if we had a way to fund a, a pit squad that could travel through the state and do on it, which control and help in these different regions. It works with the terrestrial side of plants. Oh. All right, excellent. Uh, I don't know if you want to. I'm not a tiger team, that would be a lion team. The line team, okay, all right. I don't know if you want to term the, use the term hit squad exactly, but um, well, I, I get the gist. That's a good, that's a good concept. Although we did use, what, what was the term we had before? The mass destruction mass device? Yeah. Uh, we we got to capture it. <laughs> Excellent, okay, Matt, another one? Yeah, along with all these control efforts and programs, we also need to be sure that we monitor for the effectiveness of those, of those programs. In, inherent in that is, is being accountable for what you're doing. Okay, excellent. Looks like we're starting to peter off on, on this side, which is fine. Um, you all have exercised a lot of a lot of brain cells on this. That's good. That's exactly what we're what we're looking for is different ideas, ways to move forward. We have uh, another one up front. Uh, one thing that came to mind and maybe doesn't belong uh, under this section, but you ought to limit any imports of lionfish if you develop a market, because if you happen to get one from St. Croix that has Cigatera, they could destroy our whole marketing program. So limit imports for, it sounds like consumption in particular, as far as the market is concerned, or yeah. do you feel like the pet trade, not as much, if they're live? Just human consumption. Human, human consumption. consumption, okay. I want to make sure we, we capture that correctly. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, it sounds like it sounds like we've done pretty well. You know, we, we allocated about 30 minutes for each of these topics. We don't necessarily have to stay uh, stay on that track. So if you all if y'all are comfortable with where we are, I think we've got one more comment from John in the back. Um, and then we'll try to move on to outreach and education. Uh, I was just gonna. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I was just gonna. It was. It was a word spending thing in my mind. It's not really limited imports. It's prohibit imports, and I, I think that was. Is that is that correct? Prohibit imports. Prohibit as opposed to limit. Okay. Thank you for that clarification, John. All right, let's shift over to um, outreach and education. Dan was so good to come up here and say, there's the topic we're working on right now. So um, outreach and education, what can we do? We had some, oh, okay, we've got one over on this side.
you can put together a uh, public service announcement that can be shown like at movie theaters because they do it for free. And you can have it on television because they also have to do public service announcements for free. And I just spent probably an hour at the motor vehicle division. Everybody has to get a tax license. And you have to go in now because you've got to provide documentation. And that's kind of a captured market. And a lot of them now have television. So wow, um, only an hour. Only an hour. That was great. That must have been the fastest time of all time going into a motor vehicle office. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's it. I'll get this to you. Did you have, um, did we get that right though? PSAs to DMV? Movie theaters? Movie theaters? Yeah. Right. Okay. Sorry to keep talking, but yes, it's, it's, uh, it seems to me that there is a vast, uh, untapped resource of people who are uh, in the water every day. Uh, they're near the water all the time, and that is uh, dive guides, dive masters, uh, people who are in the water on the reefs. Looking at these lionfish and looking at the, the population in general, but it seems to me that um, reaching out to that population would give you a huge amount of information. It's always been kind of a great dream of mine that if you could get a, a summit between ichthyologists and dive masters, uh, we would solve many of the world's problems uh, underwater anyway. But reaching out to dive masters, um, dive guides, dive boat captains, probably fishing, charter operators, that sort of thing. These people are out of the water uh, roughly every minute of every day uh, around our state, and they have their hand on the pulse of what's going on in the water. And those would be people who uh, can give you a tremendous amount of information and would be able to, to uh, give you a lot of information for research uh, and regulation monitoring, that sort of thing. I spoke with Alan um, about this over the break, but it's going to have regional application. It's really important to make sure that um, these outreach efforts are not done just in English. Um, in South Florida, Miami Dade County, about 50% of people don't speak English. So um, and there are a large amount of those people that are out fishing, particularly square fishing every day. So we want to make sure that the maximum number of people are helping out. We need to make sure we're reaching out to them in a language that they understand. I'm pretty sure we can guess which languages, but are there other than Spanish? Um, Spanish and Creole is actually also. Creole? Uh, okay. Usually living in Miami Dade County, you see them in three languages now. That's that's fine. Um, I know we have a lot of tourists coming in today. Do we get tourists that come in for spearfishing? Yeah, sure. We do? Okay. So other languages might be helpful as well. I mean, I know, I know there's a big influx of Europeans at certain times of year that come to Miami. Well, my, my point is that he said to for education and outreach, it's important to kind of information that is being given out. Uh, it takes just a minute to explain something to someone that is incorrect, and then that requires a lot of time to change people's perception and to put out the correct information. So I think a uh, like a checklist of basic corroborated facts and line fish is very important. You get that right? Yeah, I think in uh, corroborated facts or proof read, if you will, of the vetted, vetted, I think those are some of the words. Yeah. Yeah. Ending there and then okay. Uh, to caveat back onto the uh, first item there, the PSAs, uh, I want to add into that uh, repetitiveness to keep it in the media, in the newspaper, television, and possibly even on billboards. You know, you drive down the highways and see things. Oh, I, I, one thing I noticed about coming down towards Orlando, a lot of things about <coughs> and uh, you know, pregnancy and stuff like that. That's constantly and as people are driving out of other constants and that. And I think that there's some success being made there by keeping it you know, in the public mind, by they see it everywhere they go. I'm, I'm not 100% positive about this, but I do believe that prisoners make signs for the road department. And if we were to make <coughs> line fish informational signs, yes. Oh, okay. If 
we were to make informational signs about the line of fish and post in the marinas and boat launching sites, then uh, that's something that would last long term. <coughs> it cost that very much money, especially if we had prisoners to take that. Uh, and also, you guys have a really nice brochure. I've been handing out the brochures every time I do workshop, so get our brochure and we have to see if that's good. But a, a business card that someone can put in their wallet that has information, including websites, is a good idea. And those are even cheaper than brochures. And when you're dealing with uh, businesses, their counter space is money to them. And so something that's small that takes up less counter space might be something that they might uh, put out a little bit more than the brochures even. Okay, we have uh, we do have one over on the side. One of our note takers would like to state something. I'm not actually sure, and there might be people in the room that can comment on this. How much um, if the aquarium industry is a problem? If we're if people are still releasing, or I shouldn't say still releasing, on, if people are releasing lion fish, and um, if we think that that is an issue or something we need to get at, maybe an education program aimed at aquarium stores that they. Encourage people that if they sell them a line fish, that that line fish comes back to them when that person no longer wants the line fish, or that it goes to FWC or somebody else. But something that if you buy a line fish, maybe someone hands you something or tells you, you know, the problems and don't release this line fish, kind of like the Python issue and some of the other exotics we have. So similar to how Vanessa was speaking about getting a hit squad together to go out and do our control efforts, I think it'd be great if FWC could fund an education squad to travel around the state of Florida and educate people about these flying fish. Putting a sticker out, having t-shirts is one thing, but having somebody give you a two-hour presentation on everything you need to know about flying fish, how to safely remove them, and how to not impact the reef while you're doing those removals. I think that's education that goes a long way. You can help people increase their CPV, be more effective when they're out there and moving, and uh, get the word out. Okay. It takes a second for this thing to turn on once you turn it on. Um, so I think we're suffering from a little fatigue again here. Some pretty good ideas, but when hands stop coming up as frequently and all, it's time to move. So uh, we'd like to open this up to any other potential category. Um, it looks like we're really staying not only on time, but we may be able to you know, kind of wrap this up a little bit early today, which is good. You all have contributed some wonderful ideas, things for all of us to consider. And remember, for all of us to work on together. I've heard a lot about the FWC needs, the FWC needs, the FWC needs. And yes, we're hosting, and yes, we need to do certain things, but we need to do it with everybody's collaborative assistance, OK? And despite the fact that we do have, um, you know, a number of staff in, in, the, in the agency, um, we don't have that many staff that can do all the things that FWC is supposed to be doing. <laughs> so flying fish is just one component. It's a very important component, but it's just one component. This probably goes along with the, the previous category, but Eskimi County has done a pilot project of, of having a, uh, a lionfish rodeo. It's a very brief, um, two-month-long program. And I've heard a lot just anecdotally and, and, and people talking about other programs. Perhaps there's a way, while we're all here together, to talk about some of the lessons learned, some of the, some of the successes, and, and, and some of the lessons learned and, and the negatives that we want to avoid. Because Rick, and I are, are looking at, uh, O'Connor or Sea Grains are looking at the next um, category, and I've just kind of been working on a, on a Northwest Florida lionfish safari, and, uh, and and I would love to hear from some of the other folks, I know Reef's done some, and some of the other um, rodeos, Ken did one, maybe we could all put our heads together and, and uh, share from the successes from some of the other places around the state where we seem to have been successful. Yeah, um, based on our schedule, you know, it'd be nice if we can kind of get through everything. I think we're going to have a little bit of time in the end if you want to have those conversations. Um, you know, for interested people that would like to remain behind and, and talk about that, it'd be great. 
So let's try to do that. Um, and I would suggest, Robert, if you would like to lead those discussions, that would be fantastic. I'd like to listen to them. Well, uh, you know, but I mean, you can uh, see, yeah, I mean, seeing as you've, you've had the experience and can provide some insights, you know, if you'd like Keith or I to hang, uh, to hang out there and kind of keep things moving, that's fine. But I think that's a terrific idea. I have something uh, that kind of relates to uh, back to education, but also to what you just said about um, the state Fish and Wildlife Commission in particular having limited funding. I mean, if, if this is a problem that the public finds important, then they can influence their legislature, le legislators to increase funding. I mean, there needs to be a line item for lionfish in the FWC budget. I don't know if there is already. If there is, maybe it needs to be bigger. And we all have the power to influence our politicians and our legislators to make that happen. So if it's an important problem to us as voters, we need to make that known to our representatives. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Very good. Okay, thank you. So let's see if we can capture this related to. Okay. There was something about a line item in there, but that's fine. Increase funding. I think that's fine. That's fine. That's a good enough criteria there that that's a, you know, we can put that together. We'll polish that a little bit more, but I'll capture the line item the best we can. Yeah, this may go back to the education outreach as well, but maybe it goes beyond that. And, and I think this meeting has been really important in, in, uh, as an event to bring everybody together. And I think regular summits or forums like this would be really important looking forward to the future. So continuing these on a, on a regular basis. Okay. Well, we put on a good show here, so that's always good. We've got that, we've got one more over here. Okay, um, this is more like they bring it, going back to the desired future condition for Florida. What I'm seeing basically is multiple agencies interested with the problem on their hands, like FWC, for instance, but without the funding, the not funding or capability to put something together, how do we consider a new agency to manage this huge problem? What would be the way of thinking? Thinking a little bit outside the box, because it's a problem that is covering a lot, a lot of space in here. And we have a lot of agencies conflicting with each other. And we, as, as a result of that, we're going to repeat a lot of the same studies. We just have a little example of Bridget's getting an app and you're getting an app. Because there is this lack of communication, which is very natural, and you have a lot of people with the same interests, which is let's get right on the line. It's a huge problem, and I would love to see something like maybe a new agency. This is a big problem. So I think if you want to capture that correctly, there you need to actually develop. A new agency, the Lion Fish Control Agency, for instance? I think yeah, the, the, the question is do we need, uh, so we're changing it there. Uh, have we considered developing a new agency to manage this? Is that? With cooperation that, of all the agencies that are already. With cooperation of all the agencies. All right. Okay. They're already involved. Just want to make sure we capture that. Yeah. Capture that as I said earlier, the lionfish doesn't recognize international borders. And of course, and someone else mentioned here as well, but the lionfish obviously doesn't recognize the state line either. <laughs> to a large extent, you know, here in Florida, we're really focused on this, but it's a it's a national problem for us as well as an international problem. The question is, how do you motivate your federal? Legislators, that's where the real money is. And if we want to have a larger, coordinated, powerful effort, you know, you don't go to a bunch of fish and wildlife folks who have small ones, you bring in the Navy, right, with, with depth charges and stuff. No, the essence is a federal effort would be much more effective. Obviously, we have to work across state borders. Um, recently, a small group of people caught their hair on fire and ran around and talked about how, how bad government is and how we really shrink government, how terrible it is. Frankly, maybe a small group of people, like people in this room, catching their hair on fire and contacting their federal representatives and saying, you know, we got a problem here. 
and we'd like you to do something about it. Government can do good things, and the federal government can do good things with the tax money that we have. And perhaps it's up to us to motivate our federal politicians to do something positive with regard to the line fish issue. It's not just a local management issue. It's really a federal issue. And I don't know if any of the outside of the purview of this event, but if every one of us made a phone call or sent an email or, or visited our representative, federal representative, we might get a lot more done than with, with a, the small amount of money that we have at the state level. So it seems to me that some kind of federal hair on fire kind of response might be worthwhile, might get a lot more action. Thanks, Bill. Bill wants to make a federal case out of this. <laughs> so, uh, did we capture that? Bill, I think we did. Three statements, but okay. Very good. All right. Well, the nice thing about this, I think, is that um, you guys, as, as I said before, have contributed a lot of very good ideas. We want to capture these. We want to put these together into uh, a, uh, a format that, that everybody can, can review and understand. We want to look at these, um, and some of these ideas may be part of this larger management plan if we decide to develop that somehow, whatever our resources are in collaboration again with our partners, with you all. Um, so at this point, I think we want to go ahead and uh, wrap up today's activities and, uh, and, and uh, maybe have some time for um, Robert's idea to talk about some of these rodeo concepts. Uh, and, and better ways to perhaps learn from, I hate to say mistakes, but things that might have gone awry along the way and how to, how to correct that for future opportunities. Um, really appreciate everybody's brain power today, coming here with your ideas, presenting those in this nice open format. You know, again, um, uh, what we do is uh, uh, certainly uh, related to everything that, that you, know, you all have concerns with here, and we, we value your input. So this is a critical part of our process. So Keith, do you want to wrap this thing up? Or? Yeah, part of the summary that we wanted to do, summarizing our actions today, you know, one of the items was to go back through the research gaps from the morning session, which we were able to do after, after lunch. So we will, we will take that same approach uh, this evening, go back through everything we've captured today, refine those a little bit, and we will present them back to you in the morning. And we'll kind of go through that list. And we will uh, have, at that point, been handwritten onto large poster <coughs> boards that we will place under each one of those headings. And then we will go through our uh, prioritization process, or the, the dot process, as, as Kent explained uh, yesterday. And, and that will be a, a way for us to try to see what percolates up to, to the top. Um, for, for the group that we include in, in the discussion in our summary report after after this summit. Um, so I guess at this point I can I can pass it back to Dan Eleanor to brief us on on our evening activities. Okay. I'd like to thank everybody for hanging in there for a long day. Uh, I appreciate everything. I think tomorrow will go well once we put everything together. Also, I'd like to thank these two, Keith and, and Ken. They did a tremendous job. <laughs> uh, I feel like to thank Alan and Ben. They went out of their way this morning, found a place to clean these fish and get it done. There is a big change. change due to the weather. They pulled us inside, but the views pretty good. So you're going to go past the restaurant, straight down the hall until you hit the wall, take a left, it's up the ramp, it's the horizon room, it's got a beautiful view of the beach, ocean. So we will be having live fish, there's a pasta service, there's a carving station, cash bar, and we are going to do a little live fish uh, filet display for you guys. Um, so once again, I thank everybody. Bring your raffle tickets. We're going to have raffle some more stuff off tonight. Um, and I appreciate it once again. Thank you very much.
When will that start? 530. 530. It starts at 530. Sorry, guys. 530. So do we need to get No, I'm going to keep them for tomorrow. It's okay. I mean, I think that's a good quote. I'd like to use that at some point. I mean, I'd like to use all that. And you know what? Really, all we have to do if we want to use it like next week is just take off the hashtag and put it into my information. So I'm just holding them all tomorrow. The first one is at 12.30. So it'll give me enough time tomorrow to figure out what's going on. Thank you. You did awesome. How did it feel? Was it scary? scary? <laughs> That so was so great. I, I love to see enthusiasm like that. I'm sorry I stood up there, but I was like, oh, we got to cut it down. Yeah, no, that's fine, because he's like, you know, you can do two minutes, four minutes, five minutes. Uh, I was like, okay, that. I'll just talk. Okay, you did, you did great. Sure. Did great. Sure. Talking sure. about all that. Yay. Okay. It was nice to have that kind of enthusiasm involved. So. Right. I'll sit in. But I, but how many people? Do? I don't know. It's just Robert talking about so it's clear. I mean, we were supporting him once, but I mean, we got to win. Uh, and, uh, and uh, 